Consumer confidence stalls, home prices hit a record, and equity investors start to throw in the towel. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S., it's a much different picture than what we were looking at this time yesterday. If we saw a relief rally yesterday, maybe a little bit of a rebound, it quickly faded this morning. You can see the S&P 500 down 1.3%. It's headed to its worst close since June, its lowest level since June. It's the same story if you look at the NASDAQ 100, those big tech stocks really taking a beating. Even though we're not seeing too much action in the bond market, actually 10-year Treasury yields were lower to start the day. We're a little bit higher right now, hanging out around the highest yield levels since 2007. If you're looking for a haven, you'll have to squint, but you could find one in the Bloomberg dollar index. The Bloomberg dollar index currently up about three tenths of a percent, Romaine. Yeah, and that haven bid into the dollar, one of the big stories on the day. And of course, it could actually end up being really wreaking some havoc here with some of the valuation models out there. The dollar tracking the upward moves that we've seen in benchmark treasury yields. Yields, the J JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon says could hit 7% in a worst case scenario. He was doing an interview with the Times of India, and he said that the difference between going from 5% to 7% will be way more painful for the economy than going from 3 to 5. Remember, the first two or three percentage points were the easy ones. The next couple percentage points could be the big thing that actually knocks this market down. The valuation story also, of course, has to include the regulatory story as well. From stricter SEC reporting rules to tighter capital requirements to the slew of antitrust cases out there, including a new one, a big one, filed today. The Federal Trade Commission suing Amazon for the fourth time this year. Accusations of icing out retail rivals and strong arming sellers already on the platform to kowtow to Amazon's delivery services. Amazon says it's going to challenge the lawsuit. And in about one hour's time, we're going to hear from the regulator behind that lawsuit. FTC Chair Lena Khan. she'll be sitting down for a one-on-one -on -one interview live right here on Bloomberg. We're also going to get some insights from Tim Wu, the former White House assistant for competition and tech policy, as well as Amanda Lewis, a former House Judiciary Committee staffer who helped lead a separate 16-month investigation into Amazon and the other big tech companies. Full coverage of the antitrust cases like no other right here. But we do want to start the show off with, well, that gray swan that recently just swam up the Potomac River in Washington, navigated through the tidal basin, and is now waddling its way right up to the steps of Congress, Katie, where apparently another the government shut down loans. I was wondering where we were going, so let's talk <laughs> about that gray swan a little bit. You can see, looking from the chart behind me, that bond volatility, it has calmed down from some recent spikes. But if we get a shutdown, and that deadline on Saturday is quickly approaching. Looking at recent history, past history, you can see that sh government shutdowns tend to spur some degree of bond volatility. So we're talking about very high interest rates uh, that we're seeing in the bond market right now. We could be headed towards some turbulent times ahead, depending on what happens in the next few days. But of course, the degree of volatility depends on how long the government actually shuts down for. And if we take a look look at recent history, if we go back to 2018, that shutdown lasted 35 days. That's the longest going back 30, 40 years or so. You can see that in 1995, the government shut down for 21 days. 1977, we were talking about 12 days. So we'll see. Of course, markets are at a pretty interesting inflection point. Romain stocks falling, yields at the highest level in 15 years. You had a government shutdown on top of that. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Yeah, and as we speak, we're learning based on Bloomberg reporting that moderate Republicans right now are actually working with Democrats to try to come up with some compromise here, but of course, the big news is really what we're seeing on the far right of the Republican Party right now and whether they remain obstructionist here to a new funding bill. Libby Cantrell joining us right now, head of U.S. Public Policy and Managing Director over at PIMCO. And Libby, let's start off here with the idea of exactly what the compromise, if at all, for that matter, would be should there be able to be able to find some common ground between these two sides. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, a, I guess hope springs eternal, but I mean, a compromise uh, does not seem likely at this point now. You know, everything is uh, impossible until it's inevitable in Washington, D.C., so 
we should not necessarily count it out, but it doesn't look like the stars are aligned for a compromise, and that's really just because Speaker McCarthy, in many ways, has a Sophie's Choice in front of him. If he funds the government, it means, by definition, he's working on a bipartisan basis, working with Democrats, uh, passing a bill that could pass the House and the Senate and be signed into law. However, he probably would lose his speakership if he were to do that, or he passes a bill that can only get Republican support, has no chance of passing in the Senate, won't be signed into law, shuts down the government, but, you know, I think hopefully from his standpoint, keeps his speakership. So, again, the sort of the, the Venn diagram, if you will, of possible compromise yeah. um, in terms of both of his incentives, funding the government and keeping his speakership, at this point, they do seem more mutually ex exclusive. So again, that area of, of potential compromise seems seems quite remote at this point. On the off chance that maybe we get a continuing resolution or a, some other sort of short-term stopgap measure, would that actually change that Venn diagram at all if they just kick the can down the road? Does buying time actually improve any of those scenarios that you just laid out? I mean, it, you know, it may placate uh, the sort of the, the farther right in his in the House, the House Freedom Caucus. Um, we're really just talking about sort of five to ten to fifteen members. So clearly not a majority of his caucus. And of course, the irony here is that if he did put a CR, a continuing resolution, or even the bills that the Senate is passing at the agreed upon levels that were um, were outlined in the debt ceiling agreement back in June, those would have the votes to pass. So this, this really is about Speaker McCarthy retaining his speakership and trying to placate that group of, you know, minority but very vocal minority members. And so, to your point, though, if they were somehow able to pass a continuing resolution for 30 days or 60 days, it doesn't really change the calculus here. I, I would say sort of the one caveat, though, is if they can sort of placate, if Speaker McCarthy can placate the House Freedom Caucus members by putting some of those single funding bills on the House floor. But even those may not be able to pass. So wow. this is, is a quite, quite a quagmire for, you know, for the Speaker. And Libby, when you look at the different characters involved, the different sides of the aisles, and some of the issues that we're talking about, say that we don't get something signed by Saturday, what length of shutdown could we be looking at here? Yeah, so I think this is the real key question for both the economy and for markets, is just the duration of the shutdown. As you alluded to, there have been previous shutdowns in recent history. However, one, th one nuance here, everyone keeps referring to the 2018-2019 shutdown as the longest shutdown. That is true. But keep in mind, that was only a partial shutdown. Congress had already passed about half of the appropriations bills that they needed, so only part of the government was shut down. The, actually, the longest full shutdown that we've seen was back in 2013, and that was for 16 days. So that's really, I think, the, the benchmark that we should be using here. Our, I think our concern at PIMCO is if if the government shuts down, there may not be a catalyst or at least an imminent catalyst to reopen the government. Mm. And we have a pretty good idea of what happens to the economy if the, the full government is shut down for 16 days. But what happens if it's shut down for longer than that, for, for weeks, not days? And I think that is, that is our concern. And of course, as you all have been talking about, this is coming at a time where there's some other headwinds for the consumer, resumption of student loan payments, increased gas prices, the UAW strike, uh, the resumption of tax payments for a lot of Californians who haven't had to pay their tax bill for this year. Mm -hmm. So this comes at sort of a fragile time for the economy. And we're just worried that this could be uh, maybe, you know, have more of a deleterious impact should it go should it go longer. All right, Libby, really great to catch up with you. Appreciate your time today. That is Libby Cantrell. She is head of U.S. Public Policy and Managing Director over at PIMCO. And now let's dig deeper into the possible market ramifications of a U.S. government shutdown with Cheryl Pate. She is Senior Portfolio Manager over at Angel Oak Capital Advisors. And Cheryl, when you think about the potential for a government shutdown and you think about where we are in the Fed's path to cooling inflation, maybe ending their tightening cycle, this could mean that we get delayed releases of CPI of some of that employment data. What would that mean for the Federal Reserve and what would that delay mean for markets? Yeah, when we think about the potential impact, I think we layer that on with a couple other um, considerations and, and clearly we're in uh, this higher for longer type expectation uh, based on the latest FOMC meeting. Uh, but I think the question remains, how does that layer on with 
some of the data readings that we are expecting in the near term, core PCE, uh, GDP revisions. And then if we think about layering on potential for a government shutdown there, how does that impact the trajectory of growth? And does that, I, I think, pave the way potentially for a pause in November again? Um, it, it likely adds more volatility, as we've spoken to, but also slows, slows down the growth trajectory. So, um, you know, whether we're, we're at or near the end of the hike cycle, um, more uncertainty certainly um, will manifest, we think, both in, in the bond and the and stock market. Well, in the higher for longer conversation, let's talk about high, how high interest rates could go, because, of course, we heard from J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon overnight saying that they're still telling their clients to prepare for the worst case scenario of 7 percent interest rates. There's a lot of daylight between five and a half percent and seven percent. Do you still think it's worthwhile to game plan out what seven percent would look like or do you think that that wouldn't happen? I think, um, you know, certainly the higher we go from here, the more challenging it is both from considering business investment, but or more, more importantly, I would say consumer credit. And when we're thinking about a lot of products that are placed uh, priced off the short end of the curve, the more that increases, the more that um, impacts their debt servicing burden and, and really puts some pressure on particularly the lower income consumer in areas like credit card lending, which are priced off of prime. So the first couple of hundred basis points tend to be manageable. As we move higher from there, that's when we really see delinquencies and, and charge offs start to, to rise up. And we're just now crossing the 2019 level in terms of delinquencies. Yeah. But we expect charge-offs will, will move up from there as well. If we're talking about going up, and, you know, I, I think we're a little bit maybe um, it, not quite in the camp of could we get to 7%, but even, you know, 50 basis points higher from here um, really will start to impact the consumer in our view. Uh, do you think we're going to start to see that basically what you said as well as some of that data actually reflected in the corporate fundamentals when we start to get those bank earnings in about two and a half, three weeks time? Absolutely. I think, you know, clearly we've gone through um, a, a very significant tightening of credit standards and, and we've seen that over the last couple of quarters um, since the events of, of March and the volatility surrounding some of the regional bank failures we saw back then. Um, but what we're most concerned about from here, I think it's really going to be pivoting off, off two pieces. Number one is the NII, and, and really what we're talking about there is deposit betas and how much um, funding costs are moving up and, and you know how are banks positioned um, from a free funding perspective, if you will. Um, and then the second part is, is clearly asset quality, which we've been looking for normalization for quite some time. And I think the monthly data is starting to show that we are continuing to accelerate um, and bypass levels last seen back in 2019. So that um, really, I think, starts to come through in the next quarter or two. All right, Cheryl, always great to catch up with you. Cheryl Pate there, Senior Portfolio Manager over at Angel Oak Capital Advisors, helping you kick, kick us off to the close uh, here on this Tuesday afternoon. Coming up after the break, a closer look here at the big DEI push that came after the 2020 Black Lives Matters protest. Corporate America promised to hire a lot more people of color. We've got the data to show whether they made good on those promises. Plus, we'll get insight on where financial regulations is, is heading from Raj Cohen. He is senior chairman at Sullivan and Cromwell. And a one-on-one -on -one sit down with the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan. That coming up in just the, at the top of the hour on the heels of the latest news here. The FTC once again suing Amazon over antitrust issues. All that and more coming up in a bit. This is Bloomberg. Well, the world's mega rich are snapping up rental apartment properties across the U.S. as rent shows signs of picking up in cities including New York, Boston, Chicago, and others. Now, over the past decade, ultra wealthy individuals and their firms have more than doubled their investments in apartments, according to research from Knight Frank. Bloomberg real estate reporter Natalie Wong has been covering this story. She joins us now. And Natalie, let's name some names here. When we talk about the ultra rich, who are we talking about? 
Hi, thanks for having me. So um, for the story that we wrote about, we really focused on the ultra rich, so billionaires, some of the richest people in the world. Um, specifically, we're naming Zara founder Amancio Ortega. He has been investing pretty heavily across real estate, um, and he's really focused more so on apartments. In the last couple of months, he bought a $232 million luxury apartment property in Chicago's uh, West Loop neighborhood. And that's a pretty big surprise given how frozen the commercial property market is these days. I am curious. I mean, there seems to be a difference between, I guess, investing in something where you're tied either to the commercial space and the commercial rents versus, say, residential rents, which I think would have more fluctuations in them given just the short-term nature of the way a lot of folks rent. Right. So, I mean, you know, Ortega is a really good example of sort of looking at the differences between these investors who used to gravitate towards offices versus uh, apartment buildings. Because for the most part, a lot of these investors used to bet on offices which had stable income, uh, long term leases, 10 to 15 year durations. And thinking was companies would always need a place to work. So that is uh, stable income and also offers potential good uh, property tax breaks. But obviously, COVID has exposed that there is a major glut of supply of offices across cities from New York to Chicago, and they're not necessarily as safe of a bet anymore. So we're seeing that some of these investors are looking at uh, multifamily properties, seeing that the prices are pretty attractive right now relative to what it was two, three years ago. And at the same time, rent is still growing yeah. across major cities. It might not be booming as much as it was in 2021, some 18%, but it's still growing, um, which is not the case for other property types like offices. And Natalie, just quickly, we have about 30 seconds left. What kind of cities are we talking about? You mentioned major cities. Where are we seeing this trend most strongly? So we're seeing this across major U.S. cities from Chicago to New York. Another billionaire recently bought up a Gramercy apartment and luxury building earlier this year. Um, and we're seeing folks look at stuff across uh, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco and other areas of New York as well. Yeah. All right. Natalie Wong there of Bloomberg News. Great story on the terminal here about how some of the uber rich here, Katie Greifeld, looking for new opportunities in the rental market. And it's interesting you asked her about sort of what cities and obviously we know New York's and Boston's are always going to be on that list. But I thought it was interesting at the top of that list was Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah. And second was Grand Rapids, Michigan. Who kn I know nothing about Grand Rapids, I've, Michigan. It's been years since I've set foot in Grand Rapids, but I have heard that they have seen a, a pretty big population boom pri even prior to the pandemic, and apparently that accelerated. I didn't know rents were going through the roof like that. Cincinnati's on this list, and Hartford. Learning a lot. Hartford, Connecticut. I, I, is that a college play? I don't know. Uh, or an insurance play? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, uh, coming up here, uh, corporate America promised to hire a lot more people of color after the 2020 protests. We're going to take a look at what actually happened, some great data that our reporters here at Bloomberg have put together. That's coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Time now to take a look at our Bloomberg Big Take. In the year after the 2020 Black Lives Matters protests, corporate America promised to hire a lot more people of color. According to data analyzed by Bloomberg, that promise was largely kept, at least at the manager level. Bloomberg's Jeff Green has been covering this story, and he joins us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And Jeff, uh, one of the numbers that really jumped out at me was just the percentage of, new, of the new hires, the percentage of those new hires that fell into, I guess, the racial minority category, it was overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, the, we looked at how many people were added by the S&P 100 in that one year period directly after the summer of George Floyd, and it was about 300,000 people, and 94% of those additional, net additional workers were people of color. We, we didn't think it was right at first. We figured we must have made an error somewhere, but we kept checking, and it just, it's true. Yeah, it's pretty amazing uh, to think that the promise was kept in a big way. Where were these workers added, though? When you look at the ranks of the companies, where did most of these new hires fall? 
Well, it was there was a, a larger share at sort of the entry level jobs, the less skilled jobs. But to their credit, across the board, people of color gained some amount of share. So even at the top level in management professional roles, it was just maybe not as much. I mean, you, you could really see it in the entry level jobs. So people definitely got in the door, but they also gained a lot up to the top. So give us a sense here, Jeff, of like how we compile this data, just so our viewers have a sense here of the accuracy. This is largely data that the companies themselves are submitting to the federal government? Yeah, and it's not something they have to share with us. And for many, many years, they've been collecting this since the 60s, this was kept private. But we've been bugging them and others have been bothering them, especially the last three years, to kind of you know, open this up and give us transparency and let us see because it's, it's collected universally across all companies with 100 or more employees. So it's, it's sort of apples to apples. You know, at a, at a, and you can go, you know, it's a crime basically to not compile these numbers. So it was a uniform set of data. And until this year, we just haven't been able to look at these numbers the way we did today. And so, Jeff, you make the point in the story, which is fantastically reported, that even though we did see a lot of progress uh, in the first year or so, that we actually saw this data, that if you look at these S&P 100 companies, they're still largely white. Yeah, I mean, the, interestingly, the biggest companies are approaching 50-50, which is much better than society, which is more like the workforce is more like 70 percent white. So we are already seeing the largest companies are diversifying. But yeah, when you look at the higher ranks of the companies, people of color are still underrepresented. If you looked at the overall workforce or you looked at this workforce in terms of the S&P 100, people of color still don't have the same share mm. at the top levels of the companies. And, you know, this is a relatively small amount of workers among nine million. So adding 300 100,000 amount or among 9 million doesn't move the bar tremendously, but it's what we got. This is what we could look at. Yeah, it was certainly progress, and obviously this is a little bit backward looking, but as we look forward, Jeff, there's at least been anecdotally some evidence that some of those companies that had made these big DNI, DEI commitments have maybe scaled them back to some degree, whether it's because of political backlash or maybe just uh, economic expediency. Yeah, we won't know what happened in 2022 until sometime next year. The data isn't even due until December. Um, so I guess we'll get a better sense then. There is some indication that at least outwardly companies are trying to be less obvious about what they're doing with DEI. It's not 100% clear that it's what's happening on, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Part of the problem is, is the workforce in general is diversifying and the um, community, the purchasers are definitely diversifying. So you kind of got to hire people that look like the people that you're trying to sell to. Yeah. And there is going to be pressure to do that as we go forward. All right. Well, uh, a great uh, work of reporting and really just of data mining. Jeff Green and his team, I really uh, urge everyone to check it out on the Bloomberg Terminal. It is our big take here uh, on the day. We are going to turn back to markets here. Uh, th 30 minutes into the show right now, Katie. You're still mm -hmm. here. You haven't left yet. Still here. Uh, uh, still here to watch that sell off. There, yeah, it's a pretty big sell off as well here. We're going to cover that. And of course, still awaiting to hear from Lena Khan on the back of that lawsuit against Amazon. This is the countdown to the close, almost 2.30 here in New York, and I on the broader markets, lower in equities and well higher when it comes to Treasury yields. Let's check in right now on the commodity space with Abigail Doolittle and our commodities close. Abigail. So there's some nuance here, Romain. Unlike stocks, we do have some commodities on the rise. Commodities, of course, are also risk assets, so a different tell here on the economy. And you can see that WTI crude up eight-tenths of one percent. This as we have this battle between oil supplies tightening to some degree versus the risk-off mood tightening supply winning today. Coffee up 1.4 percent, snapping a four-day slide uh, as apparently uh, the Brazilian weather, it's rather dry, uh, causing some reason to think that maybe supplies of coffee at some point could become tighter. Up 1.4 percent to the downside, though, and the Bloomberg Commodity Index overall is down, but just a little bit. And that's interesting with the Bloomberg uh, dollar higher, uh, down 9.3 percent. This as uh, there's a now apparently uh, the thought that there's lackluster demand for European natural gas. U.S. gas is down just a little bit. And then finally, copper. Uh, down seven tenths of one percent, and of course, there's the weakness out of the China, out of uh, the China economy. This is the widest contango, though. Uh, copper trading in the widest contango, Romaine, since 1994. Contango, of course, is when future futures are higher. So right now, this is not a great tell on the economy. But who knows? Of the future look, maybe folks are expecting that we're not going to see the great 
long-awaited recession. All right, nice wrap-up as always from Abigail there. Uh, our commodities close. We do want to turn back to the markets and a closer look at Amazon. If you remember back in 2017, an unknown law student named Lena Khan wrote a paper filed in the Yale Law Review that made the case for breaking up Amazon. In the time since, she ascended to lead the Federal Trade Commission and today, making good on some of the theories that she put in that paper, filed a landmark antitrust case against the online retailer. Anna Edgerton joining us right now from our Washington, D.C. Bureau to talk a little bit more about what we know about this case and why. And Anna, let's just start off here. What are the primary allegations that the FTC is making in this lawsuit? Yeah, this complaint is really interesting because it looks at two different aspects of Amazon's business. First of all, the online marketplace where customers go to buy products, and then also the services that Amazon provides to sellers, both in its fulfillment business and also in helping those sellers reach their own customers. So it'll be interesting to see how they tie those two things together. We've seen a little bit of that complaint, and we'll get a lot more details when this actually goes to trial in court. And talk about what this means for Lena Khan. As Romaine mentioned, I mean, she has come out uh, against Amazon. I think this is the fourth case against Amazon. She's written papers about it. This has been called a career-defining moment. Is that a fair phrase to use? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that law, that law review article because that really was how she kind of rose to prominence and kind of one of the foundational papers of this kind of neo brandesian school of antitrust legal theory. And, you know, this case in particular is going to be a really interesting test case for that legal theory. You know, our current antitrust statutes were written more than a century ago for a very different economy. So part of what Lena Khan is arguing is that the way that Amazon conducts his business might not look look like a traditional monopoly in terms of market share and consumer welfare defined by price, mm -hmm. when you look at kind of a broader set of harms, there really is some anti-competitive practices going on. I mean, the track record so far for the FTC, at least under her leadership, has been a, a little spotty right now. Of course, she had a couple of uh, big losses, if you will, including the whole fight with Microsoft uh, and, of course, the whole fight with Meta Platforms uh, and within. But I am curious here about the strategy that she has taken here particularly when you talk about suing a behemoth like Amazon. This isn't a case that is just going to sort of be go to trial and be settled in a couple of months. This could carry on for years. Yeah, and, you know, I, th I think this is for the actually doing what Lena Khan said she was going to do and that she was going to bring aggressive cases, even if they don't end up uh, winning in court, it's going to have the impact of kind of deterring anti-competitive behavior in specific industries. And this is part of the kind of strategy that we see both from Lena Khan at the FTC and Jonathan Cantor at the Department of Justice in bringing aggressive cases, putting out this kind of legal theory to be tested in court and seeing whether or not that gets traction and kind of change the center of gravity of antitrust law more broadly, especially going forward into future generations. All right, Anna, really appreciate your time and reporting. That is Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton. Thank you so much. Now, coming up on Bloomberg Television, FTC Chair Lena Khan joins us live at the top of the hour. You don't want to miss it. That's right here on Bloomberg Television in Romain. Can't really imagine a better day for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Here, because I think a lot of people really want to get kind of into her brain here, right? I mean, we kind of know the general thesis of what she's pushing for here, but it's one thing to have a theory on paper. It's another thing to actually execute that theory and execute it against companies as deep pocketed uh, uh, as like an Amazon. Yeah, so stay tuned. And of course, uh, it's important to note that Amazon, it's only gotten bigger under her tenure. You think about some of the deals yeah. that Amazon uh, has gone ahead with. So that's coming up at 3 p.m. But before we get there, still ahead on the close, of course, Cisco recently announced a deal to buy software company Splunk. Next, we're going to talk about how this could build on Cisco's security portfolio and push into AI powered. She data. hasn't sued them yet. Right? Not yet. Okay, not yet. Right. In any case, this is Bloomberg. All right, time now for our top calls to look at some of the big movers on the backup analyst recommendations. And we start off with DraftKings. J.P. Morgan upgrading the online sports betting company to overweight from neutral. This following a recent slump in the shares. The analyst says industry-wide trends right now 
working in favor of the company and says DraftKings can fend off competition with that strong branding it already has and the scale that it's already established. Shares up 2% on the day. Next up, let's take a look at Wingstop, Katie's favorite. Upgraded to buy from old. This over at Seafull and the price target going up to 200. The analysts there hailing the fast food chain for its creative menu and its promotional materials. Also expecting delivery and advertising growth to drive comp sales. Shares being driven higher, owned by almost 3%. And finally, let's take a look at FlowServe. It's a maker of pumps, valves, other energy parts. Raised to buy over at Jefferies with the analysts expecting margin expansion driven by higher volumes from strong aftermarket revenue, i.e. repairs, and flow serves deal to buy VLAN, which is a manufacturer of parts for nuclear reactors. Analyst says that could add 5% to the 2024 EPS outlook. Shares of that company, though, not moving much down on the day by about six-tenths of a percent. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to stay in the sell side space and take a closer look at Cisco, the networking giant making its biggest acquisition yet, agreeing to buy software company Splunk. It's about a $28 billion deal, but the question is, why now? It's one of the main questions investors have been asking. Let's see if we can get some answers out of our next guest. Amit Daryanani joining us right now. Uh, he is Senior Managing Director over at Evercore ISI, and he rates Cisco outperform. And let's just start with what your first reaction was when you heard uh, about the deal. Literally, I think it was wow was the initial take on the deal. Uh, you know, this is one of these transactions in fairness that's been talked about for several years. Uh, Cisco trying to acquire Splunk. So it's been in the making, I would say, for a fair, fair bit of time. Uh, but the initial reaction was wow, I think. And, you know, the, the reasons why they, why they did it today versus before. Uh, but I do think long term, Cisco has been heavily focused on growing the security business. They've done some small tucking deals. They've actually changed the management team that runs uh, Cisco security a fair bit in the last 12 months. And then certainly this is probably the capstone deal for them to kind of change the shape and how they go to market with a security offering. I, I am curious. I mean, everybody, anytime you have a big deal like this, there's always a discussion about the company being acquired and what it really adds to the company that is acquiring it. I mean, Cisco, for, you know, forgive the, the phrase, is kind of an old technology company, or at least from the old technology era. Splunk is kind of the new kid on the block here. Does the cachet that Splunk has, is that going to be really accretive, both not only to the bottom line, but really just to the image of how we think of Cisco? Yeah, um, the, the hope is yes, it's going to be accretive, right? And, and certainly I would say it's, it's, it's easier to make the case that it's accretive to the bottom line. Uh, does it change the perception and the perspective that folks have on Cisco? Uh, I think the answer to that will heavily depend on how does Cisco end up integrating this deal over time, right? So Cisco today has a $4 billion security portfolio already. This is going to add another $4 billion of revenues to the security business. It's going to double that asset base very quickly for them. Uh, one of the knocks on Cisco in fairness over the last several years has been they seem to be losing share of fair bit in that core networking market of theirs. Can they stop that, right? Uh, and I think that logic will extend to security, which is can Splunk not only stop the share drain that Cisco's had, but actually flip the story and essentially enable Cisco to accelerate or stop the share gain narrative in the security portfolio where, you know, if you look at security, I think you're seeing this era or, or this timing that's happening, which is customers want to uh, coalesce around a platform strategy right now, right? They want one platform to run all the security operations and suddenly Cisco security plus Splunk could provide you with a very unique and probably best of breed platform asset for enterprises to go after right now. Well, all that being said, and you think about what Splunk could add to Cisco, is that worth $28 billion? Um, you know, it, 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 to, to some degree, you could, you know, it, listen, I think at, at $28 billion, if you look at it from a valuation basis at about six times ARR, seven times revenues, it seems to be in the zip code, all of these larger deals that have been getting done at, right? So from a, from a pure perspective, it seems reasonable. Uh, certainly, depending on how Cisco can integrate this deal, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, I would argue, revenue and cost synergies to the extent that this deal could be in a normal scenario, 5%, in a bullish scenario, 10% accretive for them, right? Uh, so certainly from an accretion basis, there is a good good bit of accretion both on revenue and the bottom line for them to make it attractive. Uh, now, now listen, to some degree, this will depend on how well do you integrate the asset, right? If you can do a good integration, 10% accretion, I think it's worth the $28 billion you paid for it. Uh, if you fumble on the accretion, then certainly the case would be, you know what, you would have been better off just buying back stock worth $28 billion versus not. So, my gut is yes, but I do think to be a definite yes, you need to see how well this deal integrates and accretes for them over the 12 months after it's closed. So a lot to keep an eye on there. And of course, we're having this conversation on a day where antitrust concerns are very much 
front and center. You think about this combination. Are there any regulatory hurdles that could slow it down? Uh, listen, n never say never on that front, uh, you know, given the fact uh, you have Lina Khan as your next guest. Uh, you know, what I would say is, listen, uh, they don't need China approval, which is a good thing. There is no product overlap. So it's not like Cisco has a massive presence in the markets of observability or security where uh, Splunk plays where you have concentration issues, right? Uh, this is really a largely complementary deal that Cisco is gonna try to do. Uh, and you can certainly make a case that, listen, these security assets, application security assets, staying within the domain of a US company is probably a much better outcome versus not. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any regulatory hurdles or issues right now. They don't need China approval, which is probably a good thing for them. Uh, but you never know how, how regulators react to a large deal. All right, great to catch up with you. I mean, great stuff. I meet Darian Anio there over at Evercore ISI. His take there on Cisco's deal to buy Splunk. Coming up after the break, we're going to have a broader conversation here about too big to fail. Raj Cohen, Sullivan and Cromwell senior chairman, going to be stopping by to discuss potential changes to Trump era guidance that made it difficult to tag non bank firms as systemically important. That conversation coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for Wall Street Week Daily with our host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, who joins us every day at this time. David, and too big to fail, words that we've been talking about since the global financial crisis. And if regulators get their way, that list of firms that are too big to fail might actually be expanded. Exactly, right, man. Yeah. You remember those non-bank banks yeah. and all the complaints that they weren't getting regulated? Well, mm -hmm. there's a prospect now they might actually get regulated. To take us through it, we have the dean, the dean of banking regulation in the United States of America. He's Raj Cohen of Sullivan Cromwell. Raj, thank you so much for being with us. So bring us up to speed exactly what we know and don't know about what the regulators are looking at. I understand they reportedly had a meeting just last week. Right. I read the report, and it was behind closed doors, so it's closed uh, to me. But clearly, for years now, there has been the question of whether there should be greater regulation of the remainder of the financial sector, the remainder other than the commercial banks. And to your point, uh, do we have systemic risk in any of them? Well, and some of the people that are mentioned, at least in the reports, are people like BlackRock, people like Fidelity, Vanguard. What is the potential risk from your point of view? You understand the system so well. If something went wrong there, how could that pose a risk for the entire system? Well, I think the only risk uh, is that these institutions would have a wave of redemptions. They would then be forced to start selling stocks to really be able to pay off the cash necessary. But I think the regulators, the government as a whole, has to be very cautious here because of all the advances which these major index funds have been able to provide to let individuals, small businesses, uh, charitable organizations invest at a low cost. And so there's a lot of good they have done. Mm -hmm. And regulation, which would frustrate those very key principles, could be very damaging to the economy and the social fabric. How are they actually going to make this assessment? Obviously, it's not just on size alone, right? I know when this discussion was being had about the traditional banks, it was more about counterparty risk and other sort of factors that really did show there was some sort of systemic nature to that business. Yeah, this is a great question yeah. because there's been a lot of debate as to whether the Federal Reserve got it right. Hmm. I actually think they did. They have a list of seven factors they consider for financial stability, and you can tweak one or tweak another or maybe add one or subtract one. But as a whole, they have it, I think, pretty much accurate. And to use those as the building block would make sense if they want to regulate anyone else. When we start to talk about the Black Rocks and Apollos and these sort of behemoths and their importance to our financial system, if there is a shift in how we deem these banks, how we sort of uh, uh, regulate these financial institutions, do you think that there will have to be a separation of some of their private equity businesses or private credit businesses from the whole? Now, I don't think that uh, there has been much of a problem because these institutions are engaged in multiple lines of business. 
Uh, that used to be the theory. Mm -hmm. I think that has been largely rejected and uh, again properly so. Maybe the first step here, rather than regulation, is to look for more disclosure to the regulators. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty Gruenberg, chair of the FDIC and a member of FSOC, uh, gave remarks, I think last Wednesday, where he cited the importance of greater transparency, again, not to the public at large, but to the key government officials. And before regulation, maybe it's important to figure out exactly what the problem is. So, Raj, maybe a disclosure first. But if they get to regulation, we don't know that they will, but if they got to regulation, what would it look like? I mean, do they have capital requirements? Do you have liquidity requirements? I mean, we know how it looks for banks. How does it look for BlackRock? So, uh, again, I'm going to cite uh, Chair Grunberg's remarks because he pointed out that probably the mistake made right after Dodd-Frank was to treat uh, non-banks as banks for regulatory purposes, and he referred to a, a binary analysis, which isn't exactly correct. So uh, you, you can't regulate an institution which isn't a bank whose right side of the balance sheet isn't the same as a bank the same way as you can regulate a bank. And it's going to take a lot of careful study uh, as to what the regulatory structure, if any, should be. In your opinion, Raj, what are the potential effects on the overall system? That is, say, we often hear when regulations are brought up, we'll reduce liquidity, we'll actually make the system less effective, and particularly right now, as we're seeing higher interest rates, higher yields, there's a lot of stress in the system right now. Could this make things worse for the financial system? No, potentially it could. Uh, regulation is a desirable objective. You can't have unbridled uh, financial uh, institutions, but regulation is not an absolute good in and of itself. It can never be. And uh, for, let me give one key example. Regulation to deal with individual institution failures is one thing. That's the lesson of 2008. But regulation to deal with exogenous events mm. like occurred in 2020, that's something else entirely. So this will need very careful analysis and study before any regulatory scheme is imposed. But do you get the sense that these proposals are sort of born out of the idea of what happened over the last couple of years, meaning a response to something exogenous rather than the actual collapse that we saw 15 years ago? I think that they are because everyone is looking at 2020 from what you can read. Mm -hmm. But again, I think you need a very different regulatory structure to mm. deal with the exogenous event than with the particulars of the individual banks or other financial institutions. Quickly here, Raj, back at the ranch, we also have regulations for the regular banks, not the non-bank right. banks, the bank banks. We've got increased capital requirements. We've got SEC requirements. What are those looking like right now? So that is a real issue, and is anyone taking a holistic view of the entire range of regulations? So you have capital, you have long-term debt, you have resolution planning, uh, special assessments uh, are going to take a big bite out of earnings in some quarter. The Community Reinvestment Act regulations are going to drop, I think, very soon. And then when you look at the banks, you have a number of consumer regulations which are affecting the bottom line. Uh, you've already had uh, the NSF issue. We're going to have a reexamination of late charges uh, on interchange fees. So there is this incredible amalgam of regulation which is occurring. It's, it's probably the greatest in certainly 15 years, if not in our lifetimes. And so looking at this, again, holistically, is really critical here. Sounds like we're going to have a busy Raj Cohen coming up here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raj. That's Raj Cohen. He's still on Cromwell's senior chairman. And tomorrow we're going to be joined by William Curtin. He's a partner at Huggin and Lovells. To Togan and Lovells to talk about M&A. And on Friday we'll hear from Walter Isaacson. He, of course, is the author of the new biography of Elon Musk. That's coming up at 6 p.m. Eastern time on, in New York.
Yeah, be sure to tune in for that. And we really encourage our viewers to stick around here on the close at the top of the hour. A one on one sit down with Lena Khan, the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, on the heels of the latest lawsuit, the fourth lawsuit that her uh, agency has filed this year against Amazon. And of course, David, I don't think I've ever read uh, a Yale Law Review paper until yeah. Lena Khan's paper yeah, started I, to I make the rounds one. a few years ago. One, yeah. I'm not an expert on yeah. the law. You are. But of course, that, that paper made a lot of waves. Yeah, yeah, I think it got her a job as a practical matter. Yeah. And I'll tell I you mean, one thing it's long. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing I can tell you. It's long. And it'll be interesting to see whether some of the theories that she has in there actually do apply. I haven't done so well in the agencies. courts yet. <laughs> Yo, that's what we're going to hear. And hopefully we're going to uh, get some answers out of her. That's coming up at the top of the hour. Lena Khan going to be joining the big program in just a second as we head into the final hour of trading right here on Bloomberg. Almost 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Another sell-off on our hands in U.S. equity markets, Katie. And we've been talking so much about these technical levels. I want to talk a little bit later about the NASDAQ 100, but I was just taking a look at the S&P 500. We're now putting the 200-day moving average in play, 4194. That's your 200-day moving average. We're trading at 4273. And if I, it just sounds like I'm rattling off numbers here. What I'm trying to paint you a picture of here yeah. right now is a downtrend. <laughs> downtrend yeah uh, well established at this point uh, if we close around these levels it'll be the lowest close since June and I don't want to alarm anyone but the VIX is actually moving uh, we're above 19 on the VIX yeah absolutely here you take a look uh, if you're looking for a bright spot here you can find it in biotechs that's largely because of some really small biotechs uh, that are up 60 70 80 percent here on the day on the back of some encouraging data but I want you to flip up the board here there's your 30-year yield at 46970 but I miss this on Monday Katie Greifeld, a key part of the yield curve yeah. is uninverted, no believe it or way. not. Yeah, the 530 curve, which is basically the five year and the 30 year, in case you know that wasn't clear there. <laughs> uh, actually, together. uninverted yesterday, and it continues to go higher. Now, we should point out, it did this back in uh, early August, I believe, and then once again in June. Now, the problem, of course, is anytime you have these inversions of the yield curve, it's the predictor of recession, but the, mm. predictor, but the recession usually is accompanied by the uninversion of the curve. So take that for what you will. And that's what they say, that it's the re-steepening that really hurts to. And of course, we were talking a lot yesterday about how it's the belly of the curve that a lot of people like right now, those five-year bonds. At the same time, you have yields on the long end continuing to go up. You add it together, it makes sense that chart looks like that. Yeah, absolutely. Here, what else you got, Katie? I got some individual movers. Let's talk about them now. I wanted to start with DraftKings. We were talking about this. Gambling. Uh, yes. Or gaming, excuse me. I'm gaming, sorry. Yeah. you know, sports betting. Yeah. Uh, JP Morgan upgraded DraftKings to overweight. Uh, and shares are higher. All right, I'm going to interrupt you right now. Amazon shares right now hitting session lows on the back of that news that we learned earlier that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is suing the company for antitrust violations. The chair of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan, I'm pleased to say, sitting down right now in our Bloomberg Washington Bureau with Peggy Collins. Let's take a listen. Just hours ago, the FTC dropped a case against one of the world's biggest companies, Amazon. And in the case, you allege that the company is monopolizing the online marketplace in a way that's harmful for consumers and for sellers on the platform. But Amazon's already come out and said it's going to fight you in terms of challenging the case, and that the case is a radical departure for the FTC from its core mission of protecting consumers. What is your strongest argument in the case? So look, this is a case about a set of unlawful tactics that Amazon has used to maintain its monopolies. Um, we note in the complaint both a set of anti-discounting tactics that Amazon uses to punish any seller or retailer that dares to discount. And ultimately, these sets of tactics deter sellers and retailers from lowering prices and closes off an entire dimension of price competition. The other set of tactics we note is a coercive scheme that Amazon uses to effectively require sellers use its fulfillment service. Um, and this, in turn, ends up stunting the development of independent fulfillment providers and ultimately also deprives actual and potential rivals of scale. And that's really the core theme here. Um, these are a set of tactics, but ultimately Amazon has pursued them to deprive actual and potential competitors of the ab ability to gain the scale and momentum needed to effectively compete online. 
and having achieved and protected its monopoly power, our complaint details how Amazon is now exploiting that monopoly power in ways that harm customers, both the sellers, the tens of millions of American families that use Amazon to do their shopping, but also the, um, uh, sorry, the, both the shoppers, but also the sellers, the, the hundreds of thousands, the tens of thousands of, of sellers that use Amazon to access. Uh, those shoppers. And it's done that through actively raising prices. Uh, Amazon takes close to one out of every two dollars from sellers that, that use its platform. Uh, it's also degraded its service by adding a whole set of pay to play ads that make it more difficult for consumers to find what they're looking for and steers them to higher price products. So uh, really encourage everybody to, to read the complaint. It details all of this conduct in great detail. And we're really looking forward to moving forward with it. So one of the things in the complaint is this phrase stru structural relief, that you're seeking structural relief in this case, which implies a breakup. What would that look like? So at this stage, the complaint is really focused on the issue of liability. Uh, we lay out a scheme that we believe violates the U.S. antitrust laws. Uh, what we note in the complaint is that these different aspects of Amazon's scheme have an aggregated effect. So the harm is accumulating. There are feedback loops between the harms. And so the net exclusionary effect of Amazon's conduct is quite significant. Um, ultimately, we'll want to make sure that any remedy is halting the illegal conduct, preventing a recurrence, and ensuring that Amazon is not able to profit and benefit from its illegal behavior. So right now, we're squarely focused on the question of liability. But uh, when we get to the issue of remedy, those are going to be the principles will be focused on. So just staying on the issue of remedy for a minute there, what do you think the company should be doing differently? So the complaint lays out a set of tactics that we believe are illegal and that are illegally elevating and inflating prices for the American people. So at the very least, uh, any relief would require that the company halt those tactics. But as I noted, uh, effective relief also needs to be restoring competition to this market, uh, which we'll be asking the judge to do as well. And when you think about the prospect for winning the case, how would things change for consumers and sellers if you do, in fact, win? So this case is ultimately about competition and competition that has been foregone because of Amazon's unlawful tactics, as the complaint lays out. Uh, as a result of that, people are paying higher prices, right? Consumers are paying more than they otherwise would. Small businesses are having to pay a 50 percent Amazon tax right now. And so ultimately, the complaint is seeking to restore the lost promise of competition Greater competition will mean lower prices, better quality, better selection, uh, and greater innovation. And that's ultimately what this case is about. So Amazon will say that it's providing a platform that has a mix of products on it, but also when it comes to merchants on its platform, it's offering more and more services to them, shipping, delivery, advertising, in terms of why they're, um, like, the charges that they have. How do you respond to that? So the complaint really goes in, in some detail about the different ways that this you know, tax effectively has been increasing steadily um, and the way that that can be evidence of direct evidence of monopoly power. Um, interestingly, at various points, Amazon did experiment with giving sellers more leeway uh, to use Seller Fulfill Prime. But once Amazon recognized that that would threaten its monopoly power, uh, it switched that off, even though sellers were effectively meeting the same standards that, that um, FBA does. So, uh, you know, the complaint really goes through all of this in, in great detail and lays out why we believe these are unlawful tactics that are hurting the American people. And you mentioned just a bit ago paid advertising, that Amazon's doing more of this, and that comes up in the complaint as well. What concerns you there? So look, ads can be useful. Ads can be relevant. Uh, what the complaint surfaces is that Amazon has used ads in ways that actually degrade the experience for shoppers. Uh, that make it more difficult for shoppers to find relevant search results, and that actually steer shoppers to higher priced products. So that's actually a degradation of service that we claim is also direct evidence of Amazon's monopoly power. Uh, you know, in a competitive world, if you have a company that's both hiking prices and worsening services for customers, that's the type of situation that should create an opening 
for rivals to come in, to attract business, to grow. But it's really Amazon's uh, exclusionary scheme that is keeping that from happening and what's enabling Amazon to effectively be exploiting its monopoly power with impunity. What do you say to critics who say, by doing these types of cases, these big swings, that you're actually getting in the way of business and the free markets? So look, this case is entirely pro-business. Uh, it is, you know, tens of thousands of businesses that are dependent on Amazon to reach shoppers uh, that increasingly are paying one out of every two dollars, as well as being subjected to all sorts of, you know, arbitrary tactics. Um, so we believe that this lawsuit, if we're successful, will actually entirely restore the promise of free competition. Uh, our free enterprise system is one where companies should be competing on the merits and not be able to protect their monopoly power through illegal tactics. If you are successful, just going back to that question about uh, structural relief, could you see a world where Amazon is you know, not one big company, but has, you know, different parts of it in terms of breaking it up and having different parts of the business be sole entities. So look, we'll want to, you know, get to the question of remedy when we get there. Um, but ultimately, the key is going to be making sure we understand what's required in digital markets to fully compete and what the aggregated harm has been in these markets through Amazon's unlawful conduct and how do we make sure that competition is fully being restored. So a lot of people will point to this paper that you wrote in 2017 about Amazon, and they point to that as, you know, rooted in your approach to antitrust and what you brought to the job. Do you feel like today, by dropping this case, you actually have come full circle from that paper in 2017? Look, in this job, I'm a law enforcer. I took an oath to really enforce uh, the laws. And this case is the result of really meticulous, careful work by our, by our staff over many years. Uh, we really followed the evidence where it took us. And as the complaint details, uh, we believe there are facts that show Amazon is violating the antitrust laws. And that's what the case is really about. So this is actually not the first case that you brought against Amazon. I believe it's the fourth. And one of the others was more focused on prime services. And earlier this month, you actually added three executives to that complaint um, in terms of the charges or alleging that the company has duped consumers in terms of signing up for prime services, but also made it really hard to cancel. What, was, what message were you trying to get across by adding those three Amazon executives to the case? Look, these are decisions that we always make on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there's a legal standard you have to meet in order to show that individuals, you know, had the direct ability and authority to participate or direct the conduct. Um, and so, you know, the, the amended complaint really lays out why we believe that's the case. Uh, we want to make sure that we apply the law in an even-handed fashion um, and are not just going after fraudsters and, you know, fly-by-night scammers while ignoring uh, you know, unlawful conduct by larger entities. And so we want to make sure that we're even handed and applying the law without fear or favor. Before we move on from Amazon, because you've been very busy at the FTC, so there's other things we want to get to, but what's the most important thing you want consumers to take away from how you're approaching Amazon? Because it's so much of a part of different people's daily lives. So look, this case is about the competition that has been lost because of Amazon's monopolization and their unlawful tactics. And consumers should be entitled to lower prices, to more competition, to more innovation. Uh, similarly, sellers should be entitled to greater competition. And this alternative universe of greater competition, greater innovation, lower prices, better quality has been lost because of these tactics. And that's what we're really trying to get justice for. So one of the other things we write a lot about, um, in addition to big tech at Bloomberg, is private equity. Um, and the Amazon case that came out today is a landmark case, but you actually have a case that came out earlier this month that involves the private equity industry, which is a first of its kind as well. And in that case, you're really looking at the practice of roll-ups um, in the private equity industry, where they're buying um, multiple companies in the same industry. What concerns you there? So this was a lawsuit that the FTC filed last week against uh, USAP and, and Welsh Carson, the private equity firm. Um, and as the complaint lays out, you know, there was a scheme here to roll up the market. 
Uh, there was a concerted scheme to do serial acquisitions by a whole set of anesthesiology practices. And then after buying them, raising the price, uh, raising the price for Texas patients, for businesses. Um, and so those are the practices that we're going after. Um, historically, there's been less attention paid to stealth consolidation through serial acquisitions or acquisitions, each one of which may not trigger concern, but where in the aggregate you have a roll up. And we, so we thought it was incredibly important to be scrutinizing these practices. And as the complaint lays out, you know, this ended up monopolizing all sorts of markets in Texas, ultimately raising prices. We also in the complaint detail certain price setting agreements as well as market allocation schemes that we think also unlawfully resulted in Texas businesses and patients paying more than they otherwise would have. So you also indicate that this is an area that you're looking at and will continue to look at. And actually, one law firm out there said, you know, it's required reading for investors and private equity firms that are pr doing the practice of buying multiple companies in the same industry. So if you're in the private equity industry, where can they expect you to look at next? So look, we follow where the facts take us. Um, this this investigation and case was in the context of anesthesiology, but uh, to no secret, there's been a lot of reporting about other areas where we may have seen these types of roll-ups. And so we want to make sure, you know, we're scrutinizing where there may be the most harm. So in the past, these type of acquisitions have gone through. How hard is it going to be for you to convince people to change course and maybe, you know, look at blocking some of these type of acquisitions in the future? So... The FTC recently, uh, alongside the Justice Department, uh, rolled out proposed merger guidelines that lay out the kind of analytical tools and frameworks that we'll be using to assess whether mergers or acquisitions violate the U.S. antitrust laws. Uh, in those guidelines, we note that serial acquisitions can also violate the antitrust laws. And when enforcers are looking at a particular transaction, we may look at that transaction not just in a silo, but as a part of an overall pattern of acquisitions. Uh, we also recently proposed an update to the HSR form. Uh, this is the set of information that companies provide to us if they're proposing a deal that triggers notification. Um, as part of that additional information, we would also be seeking a list of prior acquisitions that companies made in a particular market. And so we're hoping that that could also give us more visibility on the front end uh, to be blocking any type of unlawful roll-up scheme and preventing front harm on the front end rather than years later. So as I said, the FTC has been very busy of late. Um, one of the, the cases where you actually had um, a loss and courts pushed back was the Microsoft Activision case um, against that deal. What, are, what is one of the lessons that you learned from that experience? So look, I'm not going to be able to talk about that matter because it's still in pending litigation. But, you know, anytime we, we suffer a setback in the courts, we always look at that very closely. Um, as you know, an appeal is pending. And so we're hopeful about next steps. Another area of renewed focus for you is the issue of labor. So we're seeing strikes across the country right now from Hollywood to Detroit, and your agency announced a collaboration um, or a further collaboration with the Department of Labor recently to look at labor market and antitrust issues there. Can you tell us a little about what you're looking at there and what concerns you? So overall, we want to make sure that we're enforcing the antitrust laws to protect everybody. Uh, that means protecting consumers, but it also means protecting workers. Uh, there has been a whole set of empirical work over the last decade showing that Markets can be highly concentrated in ways that harm not just sellers, but concentrated in ways that harm labor, harm workers. Um, and so monopsony power may be more prevalent than we had previously realized. Um, so that's something that we've been scrutinizing more generally. Uh, the FTC in January proposed a rule that would eliminate non-compete clauses in employment contracts. Uh, we've also pursued enforcement actions that resulted in non-competes being dropped for thousands of workers. Um, so this is wanting to make sure we're protecting workers from anti-competitive conduct and un unlawful abuses of monopoly power is a focus for us across the board. Uh, we've entered into MOUs with the Labor Department as well as the NLRB 
to make sure that we're able to share information as appropriate and eliminate blind spots and make sure we're not just working in silos um, and able to pursue areas where we may have shared goals. And what concerns you most in terms of labor with um, some of these trends that we're seeing, especially since the pandemic, in terms of wages and where the FTC may be able to help there? So overall, we want to make sure that we're understanding what monopsony power looks like. Um, and so in our draft merger guidelines, we, for the first time, lay out how we're going to be assessing whether a merger may undermine competition for labor and for workers. Uh, you know, switching jobs is different from buying a toaster, right? There are search frictions. There are other dynamics that are unique to labor markets. Uh, there are certain metrics that we want to be looking at in terms of impact on wages, but also impact on benefits. Uh, we've heard from people that, you know, after certain mergers, the ways that the, the ways that the experience can be degraded for workers is not just through their pay being dock or frozen, but through people having less control over their schedules, right? There are all sorts of ways in which the particular particularities of how monopsony power manifests is going to look different than how we analyze markets and harm to consumers. And so we're doing a lot of conversations and making sure we're hearing from workers to make sure our analysis is really robust in that area. Another area that we write about a lot at Bloomberg is AI. How are you thinking about AI in terms of antitrust and the mission of the FTC in terms of making sure that you protect consumers? So this is top of mind for us across our work. Uh, we've noted on the consumer protection side how this is already providing a lot of concern in the ways that AI can be used to turbocharge fraud and scams in that these tools can really allow fraudsters to disseminate uh, you know, fraud and scams much more cheaply, much more quickly, and on a much wider scale. Uh, we've all already heard about the way that voice cloning can be used to scam people out of thousands of dollars. And so this is an area that we're keeping a very close eye on. Um, more generally on the competition side, you know, we want to be mindful of the ways in which um, these moments of technological innovation can provide enormous opportunity for competition, for new entry. Uh, these can also be moments where incumbents are threatened. And so you need to be very vigilant about unlawful efforts to maintain your monopoly and thwart new entrants and innovation. So those are just some of the dynamics that we're looking at quite closely overall. When you look ahead to the next year, we're going into 2024, there's a presidential election, um, things could change. So when you think ahead to potentially, you know, um, the last year of the Biden administration, or maybe not, but either way, what are your top priorities for 2024? So look, we have a very full agenda underway. Uh, we have a whole set of rules, both on the antitrust side, but on the, also on the consumer protection side that we want to see through. Uh, we're hoping to be able to finalize our merger guidelines and then continue the lawsuits we already have underway and be able to move forward with ones that are currently being investigated in-house. So I want to make sure to leave time for questions, but uh, one criticism that people have of your approach to the chair position at the FTC is that you've been taking some of these big swings, like we've talked about, about Amazon. Um, and even uh, reports are out there that some hedge funds are betting against you, that you'll be able to be successful in some of these big swings because maybe they're unrealistic. What do you say to people who doubt your approach on this front? So look, we've been enormously successful uh, on the merger front. We've had around 20 abandonments uh, where parties have walked away after the FTC has filed a lawsuit. Um, more generally, you know, the way I think about efficacy is deterrence. Uh, and we hear a lot uh, from people about how we're having a deterrent effect, right? And in a situation in which you're seeing fewer illegal deals make it out of the boardroom is really proof of concept in terms of how you want to be an effective enforcer. So on the deterrence front, we're quite pleased. Um, we have some litigations that are still underway, and we're excited to see those through. So I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, Leah, would you like to ask a question? Hi, um, Leah and I live here. Um, some of the aspects of the Amazon. And we're guys... listening uh, right now to Lena Khan, the Federal Trade Commission uh, chair, uh, speaking at our Washington bureau uh, with the bureau chief Peggy Collins there. 
a wide-ranging discussion here about antitrust policy in the wake of that lawsuit filed by the FTC in a federal court earlier today against Amazon, the fourth lawsuit against that company by Lena Khan's agency in just this year. This case, a much closer focus right now on the Amazon marketplace, whether it's strong-arming some of the sellers on that platform to take Amazon uh, services, including logistics and delivery services, or whether it's trying to ice out rivals from even being able uh, to participate on that platform at all. We should point out that Amazon has already responded, saying that it does plan to challenge the lawsuit. Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Antitrust Litigation Analyst Jennifer Ree is sitting by with us right now. And uh, Jen, you were listening in on this here. Pretty straightforward, uh, her answers with regards to why she brought the case, but kind of set the tone for us out here. I mean, she's held this position now for a little while. There's been a lot of talk as to when we're really going to see the big guns came, come out. And this appears to be one of them. Yeah, you know, we've really been waiting for this for a long time. I mean, many people think that she was really hired and put in the position of chair of the FTC, mostly because of the paper she wrote in 2017 that I think I heard you talking yeah. about earlier with David Weston and her position against uh, um, Amazon. Uh, so we've been expecting this suit. And I will say, you know, I, I hear people calling it a big swing, and it, it is a big swing. Mm -hmm. You know, she's suing a company that consumers tend to like. But I actually am a little bit surprised. I see this complaint as a little bit more restrained than no. I had expected. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that paper, it's a long one, but yeah. a, a lot of it is about predatory pricing, right. selling products below price in order to sort of capture a market for that product and, and then later raising prices. That's not really in here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is focused on two primary complaints related to the sellers on the marketplace well, and how they're treated. Well, let's take one of those, because one that I'm sure. interested in is on the seller side, because sure. we've heard these allegations. We've interviewed some sellers right here on this program mm -hmm. that have basically said, that even though it may not be an official policy that you're supposed to use Amazon's right. logistics and delivery services, it's sort of implied that if you want to do business with Amazon, you're going to have to do business with Amazon in its entirety. That's right. And listen, I don't really think this is much of a stretch for the FTC to put that into the complaint. I think, you know, they haven't gotten much attention, but there are actually four existing lawsuits already with basically that charge. Mm. I'll call it price parity, because even though it's not technically a price parity contract, that's really what's happening here based on the way the sellers are treated. Um, one is by D.C. Attorney General, one by California, and two are private. And of those four suits, three have already sustained, gotten through motions to dismiss. In other words, the judge has looked at these allegations allegations about this treatment and about the, the possibility that it raises prices uh, on platforms other than Amazon and has said, look, these are plausible. It's plausible that this could be a violation of mm -hmm. the law. So the FTC including this in the complaint I think isn't a surprise. And it is difficult to win. Um, we have case law on most favored nation or price parity clauses. You can kind of, they're all sort of the same thing. And so far, no court has called them illegal. Hmm. Um, there have been some settlements on the basis of the use of these kinds of clauses. But um, it doesn't mean that the FTC can't win. If the facts matter, if they can show that what this is doing is causing a price raising effect, I mean, that's traditional antitrust hmm. price increases, right? It's not really going out there. It's not really asking a judge to be an activist yeah. and to, you know, expand the bounds of antitrust. So I think that's a reasonable claim to be in this complaint. And it was interesting to hear Lena Khan asked about remedy. And yes. she sort of skirted that question a few different times in the case of Amazon, what would a potential remedy look like? Could we see a world hmm. where there's three Amazons? <laughs> I, I think it's unlikely, even if the FTC proves liability on both of their main counts here, that we would see some sort of a structural remedy um, and for a number of reasons. But let's say if we did, then one of the possibilities might be to break off its logistics services. Because, for instance, one of the claims here is that a seller, in order to be eligible for Prime or to have nice placement, you know, in the search results, um, you, or to be treated, you know, essentially well by Amazon, has to also buy the fulfillment services. So one option would be to split those two, the marketplace from fulfillment. That could be one thing. Um, I just think it's really unlikely. Um, and part of the reason is because we've seen solutions to these problems. Both the UK and the EU have basically waged the same claims against Amazon as the FTC. And in both of those jurisdictions, they have either settled or they have a settlement underway. Mm -hmm. They've promised not to do this, essentially. And, and really, from the Microsoft precedent, what we understand is that when a company is found guilty of wrongdoing, what the judge is supposed to do is find the least drastic remedy they can to stop that wrongdoing. And that wrongdoing can be stopped, 
short of a structural breakup because we're seeing that at least so far in the EU and in the UK. And so when you look to the EU and the UK and the case studies that we have there, does that give us any sort of blueprint for how long this FTC suit against Amazon might take to be resolved? Well, those cases basically resor were resolved with settlements without litigation. So I think the timing is going to be a little bit different. I believe we should expect a really long time frame here because I, I would expect just to get to trial, it's going to be two to three years. And it's likely whoever loses is going to appeal the case. And so you need to tack on at least another year, if not more, after that. So this is going to be an overhang for Amazon for some time. Well, what does the continuity look like? I mean, you've covered this topic for, for years now. And I know, obviously, Microsoft is kind of the case study for these right. lengthy uh, antitrust suits. But, you know, if her t if the president's current president's term ends and presumably you get a new president who's going to want a new FTC mm -hmm. chair here, how does that affect, if at all, these types of cases? Well, it's going to be up to that FTC chair, and it's yeah. very possible they could just decide to settle the suit. That, that's basically what happened with Microsoft, mm. right? We had a change in administration, and the new administration decided to settle rather than continue to pursue an appeal. Um, but remember that this investigation, at least, was started under the Trump administ administration. Yeah, there is bipartisan yeah. interest in going forward. And I suspect that even if we have a change and this lawsuit's ongoing, it will continue. That, that's what I believe will happen. All right. Uh, Jen, always great to uh, talk to you. Uh, Jennifer Reed there over at Bloomberg Intelligence, who covers uh, the antitrust sector for us. We want to continue our focus right now uh, on the lawsuit, uh, not only uh, the FTC versus Amazon, but the FTC versus Microsoft, the FTC versus everyone, the, it seems, these days. A part of a new push here to rethink our antitrust laws, to rethink what it means to be a monopoly. Timothy Wu is one of the great minds in this space, a professor of law, science, and technology at the Columbia Law School. Tim also served on the National Economic Council during the Obama administration as a special assistant for competition and tech policy uh, as well in the Biden administration too. Uh, Tim, great to have you here. And, and I want to start off here on kind of not just this lawsuit, but kind of the underpinnings you know, ideologically, uh, we talk so much about Lena Khan's paper from several years ago, uh, but she was not alone. This idea that so much of antitrust uh, enforcement, so much of antitrust think has been focused solely on whether you and I, the consumer, are getting a lower price for that good or service. And she seems to be making the argument that we have to broaden that, to look at the original language in the Sherman Act and look at the economic consequences overall. Are you on board with that? Uh, yeah, I am on board with that. Um, I think there's a, a sense that, that goes beyond uh, Lena and the FTC. Um, and, um, uh, and, and this uh, Justice Department uh, in thinking that there's been an under-enforcement of the antitrust laws over the last 20 years and that they should be enforced uh, somewhat more as uh, Congress intended um, when they passed the laws in uh, 19, uh, 1890, 1914, and, and 1950. In other words, there's been a big movement to go back, <clears throat> something more like the original intent of the antitrust laws, uh, which was a broader sense of promoting competition, less simply focused on price metrics. Uh, what sort of gets us there, though, Tim? Because, uh, I mean, when I think about the legal strategy that a company will take, particularly a deep-pocketed company, I think it's easy for Amazon to point to the benefits that their business model has had for at least a certain cohort of consumers. It seems to be a much tougher climb to say that, yes, what you did had benefit, but there were damages to our economy or damages to consumers or to sellers that far outweigh that? Yeah, well, I don't think that's what uh, Lena is saying in this particular, or Chair Khan is saying in this particular case, just to make that clear. Uh, the case against Amazon, I think, is a pretty much a Main Street, a straight down, straight up uh, consumer case. Uh, she uh, uh, and the FTC are alleging uh, that what Amazon is doing, whatever you might have thought of Amazon in the old days, uh, was in fact, is, is in fact uh, not lowering prices, but raising prices. So, you know, maybe they were a, a great deal in the old days, but they've, they've turned us down. I don't think this movement is interested in trying to uh, punish companies that are doing a good job. I think this movement is actually interested in enforcing the laws to take on some of the low-hanging fruit uh, and some of the uh, violations of the law that have been ignored. Uh, you know, we had 20 years with very little, with the exception of Microsoft, enforcement against monopoly maintenance. And uh, we've allowed an enormous number of mergers to go through, which have proven to be very bad not just for consumers, but also for workers, also for uh, outcomes in areas like healthcare. So I think there's just a, a broad sense that we let things go lax and the whole focus on prices ended up being an excuse for doing nothing.
Well, to your point that the goal here isn't to punish companies doing good things, it's just to enforce laws. You bring that logic to this case against Amazon, and what should potential remedy look like in your view? Yeah, that's a good question about, about remedy. I mean, I'm not surprised that uh, Chair Khan was uh, staying away from that question, as it's a, a delicate one. Um, you know, I think that structural relief should never be off the table. Um, you know, the antitrust laws, when you get da down to it, when you look at the trust era, uh, we're about breakups, and we're about stimulating competition the most obvious way possible, which is to uh, stir the pot and reset the industry. Uh, one of the problems we've had with just having orders to not do things is that courts, uh, or not courts, but uh, companies ignore them. Um, you know, they, Amazon has sworn many times that they will not uh, punish sellers who are selling for less than other uh, uh, platforms, and then they go ahead and punish them anyways. So uh, I think structural relief should never be on, off the table. You know, what it looks like in an individual case it has to make sense. Maybe it's fulfillment. Who knows? Um, you look at other cases like Google. Uh, maybe there's parts of Google that are giving it uh, an advantage in its search engine that it's using uh, to maintain its monopoly. So I, I, I don't want to say a particular remedy, but I do think structural relief needs to be on the table. And, of course, this current case, the FTC suing Amazon, has been billed as a career-defining moment for Lena Khan, and you think about some recent losses in court, of course, Microsoft, Activision, Blizzard deal. When it comes to in the FTC's track record, when it comes to its reputation, in practice, does that actually matter? Does that dictate at all the outcome for future shots they may take? I mean, I don't think so. I think every case is on its merits. I think the uh, business press is focused too much on the Activision case. I mean, one of the things that uh, Alina and Jonathan Cantor both said is that we don't want to be the kind of uh, enforcement officials who only take a case we're 100 percent sure of winning. I mean, I think that's the problem we've had over the last 20 years, is the lawyers have been too cautious. Uh, they have not enforced the laws the way Congress wanted, and they've been unwilling to bring a case that has any chance of losing. So, you know, I think they have very strong cases here. I, I was impressed by the Amazon complaint. Um, uh, it's a, as I said, straight up uh, consumer pricing kind of case. And I, I think they're going to win some, they're going to lose some, but they're happy, you know, to have a batting average of 500 or 750. They're not aiming for 900, 999. And just finally, uh, Tim, we only have a few seconds left. I am curious about the follow through. We were talking about this with our previous guests, the idea that if you get a new administration, particularly for a case like this that we know is probably going to drag on for years, what happens? Not just with this case, but really just the overall idea of writing, uh, I guess, some of the uh, past wrongs, if you will, that you just talked about. Yeah, you know, I studied the history of the antitrust uh, laws, and these. Uh, 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 movements or these tendencies in enforcement tend to go through these long cycles, 10 or 20, 30 years. And I think there's definitely been a turn, uh, and we're not going back to non-enforcement or to, to sort of lax enforcement. Um, I, I think there's been a turn, and I imagine it'll last uh, several administrations at least. You know, maybe at some point a president will say things have gone too far, uh, but I would not be surprised at all. If you look at something like the litigation in the 60s and 70s. It went through all kinds of presidencies, different parties. You know, Theodore Roosevelt was uh, a Republican, um, obviously, but Wilson was a Democrat. Yeah. They kept their cases going. So I think antitrust as a way of going through different administrations. And, and Tim, I'm sorry, and before I let you yes. go, I do just want to make a quick pivot here, because we learned a little bit earlier that the FCC was uh, considering uh, reintroducing effectively that effort towards net neutrality, of course, a phrase that you coined and something that you advocated for. What was your reaction when you heard that they were going to do that? I think, I think that's good news. It's a campaign promise. It's also something that uh, I think stimulates competition, and the more forms of stimulation of competition and innovation that we have, the better. All right, Tim. So gonna have, I'd say overdue. All right, Tim, I'm going to have to leave it there. I appreciate you taking time for us. Uh, Timothy Wu there over at the Columbia Law School and formerly uh, with the Biden administration helping to craft their competition and antitrust policies. A lot more coverage coming up here on the big program, including a look at Tesla. It's our stock of the hour. Up next, this is Bloomberg.
time now for our stock of the hour. Look at shares of Tesla, which have been under pressure all day. This after Bloomberg reported that the company is caught in the crosshairs of an EU anti-subsidy probe. Keith Naughton joining us right now, who helps to lead our automotive coverage out of our Detroit bureau. And Keith, uh, give us a sense here as to what we're talking about. We're talking about cars that Tesla is making and selling in Europe. What is the anti-subsidy issue? That's right. Uh, Tesla's major export hub has become its plant in Shanghai. They export almost 100,000 uh, cars a year to Europe from that plant. And the EU is looking into all Chinese-made EVs to see if they're getting an unfair leg up on the European competition because of subsidies that the Chinese government provides. And Keith, is it, if it is found that Tesla has benefited from those Chinese subsidies, what would that mean for Tesla, what would happen to them? Right, so the possibility is that Europe would impose tariffs on Chinese-built EVs, including Teslas. Right now, Europe has a relatively low tariff of about 9% compared to the United States, which is, has a 27.5% tariff on Chinese-made EVs. So if that goes up in Europe, that becomes a barrier to that market for Tesla and all the other EVs that come from China, from BYD and NEO and others. I, I sort of understand that there's a cost advantage for Tesla making uh, those uh, vehicles uh, uh, out there in China here. But we also know they've been trying to set up manual manufacturing facilities in Europe itself and in other parts of the world here. Is there not a way for Tesla to sort of, in a cost-effective way, to shift some of that production around? Well, they do have a huge factory going up in Berlin, so that will provide them a, a very local source of production for the European market. But there is an edge coming out of China because the government gives you subsidies on loans, land, there's all sorts of things. An analyst I spoke to said that Chinese-made EVs have a 20 to 25 percent cost advantage. All right, Keith Naughton, uh, our man out in Detroit here, a look here at Tesla and uh, the anti-subsidy probe coming out of the EU. Let's continue the conversation right now and switch to AI, open AI to be specific, the company behind the behemoth chat GPT, talking to investors about a possible share sale. Wall Street Journal reporters saying that it would value the startup between 80 to 90 billion dollars. Ed Ludlow, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, joining us right now. And 80 to 90 billion sounds like a lot. What was it valued at before? Yeah, it is a lot because when they closed the most recent share, uh, share sale in April, the valuation was around $29 billion. So this is a significant jump. But part of what the, the Wall Street Journal is talking about is something Bloomberg's already reported that. OpenAI is on track to around a billion dollars of revenue this year, a lot greater than that in 2024. So while it's a jump up in valuation, and this is based on an insider share sale, by the way, not uh, issuing new shares or a new round of equity with VCs, um, you know, they, they seem to be doing real business, you know, and, and kind of leveraging the front runner or, or market incumbent position in generative AI. And so, Ed, talk to us a little bit about the fact that this is an insider share sale, that this would actually come from employees at the company selling their existing yeah. shares versus the company issuing new ones. Is that typical for startups of this stage? I wouldn't say that anything about open AI is typical uh, in the world of startups. I mean, look at the cap table. Microsoft owns about 49% of this company, right? They've put $13 billion of it into date. And, you know, while the revenue figures are really interesting, um, the, the, the comp compute cost, right, to train these models, but also uh, to give API access to third parties, either, you know, consumers through a subscription or enterprises through um, integration with their existing services, the compute costs are so high. And a big part of Microsoft's backing is credits for Azure Cloud. So there are other names that have invested in OpenAI. For me, the, the story here is really similar to what you see with SpaceX, a kind of late growth stage startup that's been founded quite a while ago where employees are long serving employees that want liquidity for their stock. And often that's the motivation you see for an insider share sale like this. All right, Ed Ludlow, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, one of the biggest stories of the year involving AI, involving ChatGPT, and involving open AI, now said to be valued at somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to $90 billion, if you believe, Wall Street Journal reporting. Meanwhile, a turn back to the broader markets here, still at session lows here for U.S. equities. Amanda Agati going to be joining us, PNC Asset Management Chief Investment Officer, as we count you down to the close with just about 14 minutes until we get there. Katie Greifeld, another wild day here in the market. 
markets. A wild day, a sell-off intensifying the S&P 500 at one and a half percent lower. Yesterday feels like a long time ago. Absolutely here. A lot more to talk about. Stick with us. Romaine Boss again, Katie Greifeld. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. Katie, you got to make sense of this market for us right now. We're actually looking at one of the biggest and most steepest sell-offs that we've seen all year long, not just on a percentage basis, 1.6 on the S&P 500. But as of right now, only 38 stocks in that index are in the green. And I'm excited to talk about what is actually driving this sell-off. I know we had a hawkish Jerome Powell last week, of course, higher for longer. You think about the long and variable lags, but still 1.6% lower on the S&P 500 right now, looking at the worst monthly performance of the year. Yeah, and remember, last week we were talking about how the S&P had erased its gains for September, mm -hmm. erased its gains for August racist gains for July and as if we sit right now at these levels we're on the precipice of actually erasing the gains from June as well so this is a pretty big clawback it's a pretty big clawback let's get into it now with Amanda Agati she is PNC asset management chief investment officer and Amanda help us make sense of this you think about what we're seeing in the stock market is this a reaction to Jerome Powell maybe that higher for longer message finally sinking in or is there something else going on well, it's so nice to be with both of you. Thanks for having me back. I would say it's really a confluence of things. And at these valuation levels, and given how strong the rally has been uh, up to this point in the year, I think we're really struggling to find what those remaining positive catalysts are to keep this rally going, while at the same time, the list of negatives is certainly mounting. A very hawkish Fed, a higher for longer, or in my view, I just keep saying longer for longer because everything <laughs> about this monetary policy tightening cycle is going to take longer than investors want. But the UAW strike is continuing. We have a government shutdown looming. We have Moody's threatening to downgrade the U.S. credit rating, student loan payments coming back online. I'm almost up to a top 10 list of key <laughs> risks uh, to impact the market rally here. So it's a lot for investors to process, all kind of coming together all at once. So you add it all together. Are you, uh, is there anywhere really that you can play offense here? Or is this a market where maybe you should be looking at your havens and loading up? Well, we've definitely been in de-risking mode all year to try and get ready for what we thought would be uh, a correction in terms of uh, the markets here. And of course, the first half of the year uh, went the opposite way, but we haven't pulled the ripcord and raised a ton of cash. So when we say de-risking and playing defense, it's much more thinking about ways to create ballast in portfolios. So we've been leaning very hard into quality exposures, both on the equity and fixed income side of the equation. Just very recently, we're leaning into quality dividend growth, to kind of take a step back uh, a little bit from exposure there and also look at minimum volatility factor. I think that's very well positioned in this environment, particularly if volatility in and of itself is starting to pick up like what we've seen the last few trading days. Do you think that's going to be a sustained uh, type of trade here? And the reason why I ask that, Amanda, is I feel like at certain points in this year, we saw a lot of people sort of rotate in those areas, primarily for the reasons that that you outlined, but then the first sort of sense that maybe, you know, things might not be that bad or the Fed would have their back, then everybody piled back into growth stocks. Well, it's certainly not a position that you want to stay in from a strategic perspective. We're taking a very tactical somewhat near-term kind of approach to positioning there. And it's really all guided by our view that we're continuing this slow march toward recession. We still believe that a recession, though mild in nature, is likely to occur in early 2024. And so this is an unusual time, this cycle, where we've had plenty of time to get prepared. Mm -hmm. um, in the past few, uh, you know, market uh, collapses and economic collapses, onset of the pandemic, financial crisis, it was almost like a rubber band snapping. And so it's feeling a bit more orderly this time. Um, we don't want to stay in minimum volatility factor exposures for too, too long. But it feels like the time is very much right, aligning around our economic outlook, continuing to cloud into the end of the year. When you look at the markets, uh, you know, all the sort of different asset classes out there for sort of, I guess, a read, not just on market sentiment, but maybe how people are interpreting economic conditions, interpreting the Fed here. Is there anything specific that you focus on more than others? 
I, I don't know that there's any one like sector or industry in particular that we're focused on in general, but I would say right now we're very much focused on the health of the consumer, the strength of the labor market, and of course as that translates into consumer discretionary consumer discretionary and consumer staples oriented sectors and positioning there. You know, the consumer is hung in there far longer than I think what most would have expected given everything that we've been through these last few years as a result of the pandemic. And so hanging in there, given how late in the innings we are, but cracks are definitely starting to form and shifts in spending behavior and patterns are starting to form. And so it all sort of lines up with our view of this being very much late innings of the cycle. And we are gonna eventually kind of tip over into contraction. And I think that underappreciated risk from student loan payments coming back online effective now is something that's really going to pressure consumers. And I don't think that's understood very well or certainly priced into the market at these levels. Well, Amanda, I also want to get your thoughts on some of the leaders of the market, the biggest companies out there, your big tech names. When you think about this higher for longer, longer for longer environment that we're in right now, how are you thinking about big tech? Because you could make the point about valuations. They're still very expensive. But we were having a fascinating conversation with Ed Klissold yesterday of Ned Davis Research, who said, if you think about interest expenses, some of those big tech, mega cap tech companies are best positioned to manage those versus maybe the rest of the market? We're not betting against uh, mega cap tech or AI or um, tech and communication services in general. We still think that those business models are very unique, very well positioned, and such dominant forces in this environment, given how large they have effectively grown to be and how much of a needle mover they are in terms of the indexes. So we're not betting against them. But I think in this environment where valuations are sitting, you know, we're talking 60, 70 or higher times uh, forward PE, 40 plus times price to sales. These are really extended valuation metrics. And while the underlying fundamentals continue to be strong, yeah. I'd be much more excited at a lower entry point here. So we're not betting against it, but we're not uh, actively putting a lot of capital to work in those areas right now. All right. Great conversation, Amanda. I, I am curious, like when the cameras are off and no one's in your office, do you just turn around and talk to Dwight Schutte there? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he's my best friend. <laughs> That's why he sits over my shoulder. It's um, cute. <laughs> Amanda, great to talk to you. Amanda Agati there over at PNC yeah. Asset Management helping us count you down to those closing bells. Just about two and a half minutes to go. Katie Greifeld, 90 percent of the S&P 500 in the red right now. Yeah, it's a pretty brutal day. It's turning into a moment a bit when you think about we're finally at levels that we can talk about. Usually you see a sell off and people say, well, zoom out. We're only yeah. at levels that we were at last week. But we're talking about the lowest close potentially on the S&P 500 since June. Yeah, really clawing back some of the gains that we had earlier this year. As we move closer to these closing bells, we have a lot to parse for you. Our full market coverage right here on Bloomberg starts in a minute as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Carol Masser and Tim Senevic. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms on another down day for the markets, mm -hmm. shaping up to be one of the broadest based sell-offs we've had in a while. 90% of the S&P lower. And when we had that shot, guys, coming into you here, they showed the outside of that radio studio and the headline at the top of that studio said, Bears in Charge. Yeah. <laughs> and not the Chicago I Bears, I love that you watch it. No, yeah. not the Chicago Bears. Uh, it's interesting, right? What, three-month lows on the major equity averages, the S&P Dow and the NASDAQ and I think it's pretty significant, right? We haven't seen this. And again, we keep talking about kind of this rate reset environment. Nancy Tengler was just on with us. She says, hey, folks, in terms of yields and the rate environment, we're just kind of getting back to normal. And we have to put some perspective on this. When we had negative rates, that was the anomaly. Yeah, she said she spent, you know, she's been in this industry for 40 years and spent most of her career and rates were, you know, where they are right now, Katie. Um, but at the same time, she's continuing to, to buy into technology right now. She said companies like Oracle and Broadcom um, 
are, are, are appealing to her right now, and she could even see another five to seven percent decline on the S and P five hundred before AI the end of the year. Related angle, right? Exactly. She called them like the old school tech players. Mm -hmm. Well, on the topic of what's normal in a normal rate environment, I trotted this uh, stat out to Romaine yesterday. If you go back two hundred thirty years of history, four and a half percent on the ten year Treasury yield. That's the average. So there you go. Yeah. 200 years? That's interesting because Katie keeps bringing this up. And what's great about it is there's, I don't think there's any way for us to actually check this because I don't think anyone's, anyone's data goes take back 200 and she uh, has something. She from Taylor. Yeah, something years here. All right, guys, we've got a lot to talk about here. I want to start off with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It is down about 389 points, around 33,600 points. Down about 1% here on the day, but more importantly, a close back below its 200-day moving average, the first time that that's happened for the Dow Jones Industrial Average since May. The S&P 500 lower by about 64 points, or about 1.5%. Uh, it is uh, close, getting closer to that 200-day moving average, but we should point out it is now on the precipice of being an oversold territory when it comes to the RSI. The Nasdaq composite down more than 200 points, or 1.6%, and the Russell 2000 going to finish lower on the day by about 23 points, or 1.3 percent. All right, digging a little bit deeper into uh, the big cap names, the S&P 500. We've got the S&P 500, as you said, Romain, broad-based in terms of selling. So 455 names to the downside, Katie, uh, 46 to the upside, two unchanged. So really a risk-off day. And unless my eyes deceive me, you take a look <laughs> at the industry groups. Every single one is down. We're talking about 24 industry groups. Uh, hopefully we'll show them soon. Every single uh, industry in the red there. Telecom was, you know, your relative best bet, uh, but still down two tenths of a percent. Then you go down the list. Some of the biggest losers there is tech, hardware and equipment. Utilities, which is interesting. Uh, usually that's a defensive sort of sector, but on a day like today, everything's red. And then finally you have retail leading losses down about three percent. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers. I did find a few. Um, Fisker, among them, it was up almost 22% at its highs today, finishing the day with about a 9.6% gain. What was going on? The company saying it has built 5,000 Fisker Ocean SUVs and expects to ramp up deliveries of the ocean to 300 vehicles per day later on this year. Analysts over at Bank of America reinstating coverage on this company with a buy rating and $8 price target, stock closing at $5.82 a share. Thank God for the biotech sector today because that's where a lot of my gainers were. Uh, Immunovent, uh, this stock up almost pretty much doubling on the day, up 97%. It's a biotech, about a $5.2 billion market cap. Uh, this after the company announced top line results from an early stage trial of its drug for autoimmune diseases, which analysts call a best case scenario. And then the majority shareholder in this name, Ryovent Sciences, also rallying in today's trade. So we'll flip on over to that one. That was up uh, just about 21% in today's trade, and that's about a $9.8 billion biotech company. One more for you. Intercept Pharmaceuticals up almost 80% in today's session after Alpha Sigma said it has entered into, into a pack to buy the biotech company for $19 per share in pack, and the stock just closing just below that $19 mark. All right, well, I had a much easier job today finding the decliners. So we got shares of the mega caps uh, really dragging down the benchmarks today. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Tesla, all dragging the NASDAQ S&P 500 lower today. I do you want to check in on shares of Amazon finishing the day down more than 4%. Uh, the FTC suing Amazon today, this in a long-awaited uh, antitrust case, accusing Amazon of monopolizing the online marketplace service by degrading quality for shoppers and overcharging sellers. Just in the last hour, we heard from FTC chair Lena Khan telling her own Peggy Collins that Amazon exploded exploited its monopoly power with impunity. She also called Amazon fees a tax and said she'd work to ensure Amazon case moves expeditiously. Uh, moving on to Target, also breaking within the last hour. Uh, shares finishing the day down by 2.5%. Uh, shares spiked lower after the company said it would close nine stores in four different states to stem losses from rising retail theft. One location here in Manhattan will be closed, two in Seattle, three in Northern California, and three also in Portland, Oregon. And then also United Natural Food Foods, finishing the day down more than 28%. That's the lowest since May of 2020. This after the company gave a profit for outlook for the fiscal year that missed the consensus estimate. The company said it saw adjusted EBITDA of 450 to $550 million. Estimates were for 617.2 million. 
$1.5 million. And I'd say I have one more to that list there. Uh, Instacart, uh, the company formerly known as Maple Bear, down about 1.7%, a close at 29 dollars 89 significant of course because they went public at 30 bucks a share so a break in price here on instacart some of the big new issues that were supposed to help lift this market some of the pressure that we've been seeing in the treasury space and in the fx space a big part of the reason why you see the downdraft in equities at least here on the day we did see the curve shift higher pretty much across the board once again most of the activity most of the selling i should say on the longer end of the curve with your 20 and 30 year yields up by about four basis points here on the day modest gains in terms on yield on the rest of the curve, up about one and a half basis points on your 10-year yield. And guys, we've been remiss in not pointing out here kind of how the day started. We kind of forget we had those consumer confidence numbers, mm -hmm. uh, which I think really uh, yeah. rattled a lot of people. And then you had home price numbers, of course, hitting record highs, uh, which adding again to some of the concerns about inflation. Well, yeah. what's interesting is that it's not spurring a haven bid for treasuries. Like you might expect to see when you see consumer confidence come in at those levels, what the haven is in this environment, the dollar, maybe gold, but it uh, surely is not bonds right now. Yeah, it's interesting. It's funny that you mentioned the dollar. Nancy Tangler also saying that's going to be problematic, you know, that stronger dollar potentially um, for a lot of companies. She's watching earnings uh, very carefully, um, although she expects, I think, some upbeat surprises. Having said that, I'm thinking about what Jamie Dimon said about maybe this 7 percent, yeah, right, in is... terms of rates. Like, I think that's I feel like people are ratcheting up their expectations as to how high this could go. Yeah, I mean, and, and if, in fairness, I mean, he did say that was the worst case scenario. But when I hear people throw out numbers like that, like 7 percent, and I'm just thinking, where is that coming? Like, how do we get to 7%? Do you guess, think he chooses his words really carefully, right? Rather than 6% or 8% or 5%. I, you know? I guess we get to 7% if the economy continues to prove resilient and we don't see, you know, a pullback in inflation. Yeah. And the Fed continues to say that it has, has more work to do. But, you know, we're still, we're, we're, I think it's fair to say we're still far away from 7% at this the, point. The thing about his comment that I think really jumped out, I mean, it wasn't just the 7%, but the idea of just how much pain mm -hmm. gets caused at right. the latter stage here, right? The idea that the first first couple percentage points, mm -hmm. everybody was kind of shrugged that off here. From you go from three to five percent, people get a little bit worried, but the trajectory from five to seven percent is going to have just some huge ramifications should that play out. Yeah, well, I believe he quoted of, Warren Buffett in, yeah. in that one and saying, you know, when the tide goes out, we see who's swimming naked. And that's, you know, that's not a place we want to get to. Yeah, we've Warren all been there. Buffett I mean, the refreshing, <laughs> cool water washing over your body. <laughs> but it's kind of the flip side what uh, Jamie Dimon was saying to the fight against inflation, that getting from nine percent to four to five percent is a lot easier than getting from four percent all the way back to two percent. Uh, it's kind of the same coin, different sides. And I don't know, seven percent. I think a big key there is that if we see inflation re accelerate, uh, that would be one of the necessary components for when we should talk about 7% Fed funds. And, and before we even get there, right, I mean, uh, you know, everyone was also talking about this idea of the government shutdown, uh, which could could happen this weekend. Of course, the the, the fiscal, mm -hmm. another fiscal cliff. I don't know what, what, what kind of cliffs are going on in Washington. <laughs> but as I was pointing out to Katie, did you like my waddle, waddle joke a little bit earlier? The quack, quack, waddle, waddle? Yeah, but pretty the, good. Yeah, but the gray swan event, basically. I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, yeah. we were speaking with Libby Cantrell over at, at PIMCO, and she made a good point. She's like, if there is a shutdown, the real fear right now is that she doesn't actually see a catalyst for a reopening. Mm. She's basically saying that the conditions that would lead to that would basically mean that it would be almost impossible to create some sort of compromise to reopen the government at, soon. At least the government won't be spending if it's shut down. So. Read Josh Green's piece that the party that calls for the shutdown, man, there's usually political repercussions. It kicks back at them. Uh, it we're, doesn't we're work. We're in different times, Carol. Mm -hmm. Are we? Yeah, I mean, I don't think they care. There's a certain faction that just doesn't care. Which is crazy because I think... They're playing a different game. Vocal many, faction. You know what's crazy? We talk so much about the shutdown, right, and just the political, you know, d d deficiencies, if you will, in Washington, rather than talking about the substance of what they're trying to do. <laughs> is right? there substance deficiency? That's a diplomatic way Ten of saying Ten government well, shuts down, shut down since 1980. Don't you want taxpayer kind of actually what's what's in what they're doing in terms of a budget where they're as spending a taxpayer money? you know what I would like is Congress to do their constitutional duty which is pass a budget on time something that they haven't done in decades how about that and keep dreaming mm. you know, all right everybody watch for Costco their earnings are going to cross like <laughs> uh, this Bloomberg opinion piece brought to you by Romaine Boston yeah, fine you can quote me on no that. I know I know <laughs> you won't get a lot of people debating yeah, wait, wait till the mics different go way. off Carol. I'm going right. give you an earful that's, I know where you sit that's a wrap we'll defend you that's a wrap our cross platform coverage radio TV YouTube and Bloomberg originals we will see you again tomorrow
All right, stick with us here on Bloomberg Television. We're going to go back to one of the other big stories of the day, and that is the U.S. FTC lawsuit against Amazon, accusing it of monopolizing the online marketplace. Amazon has already responded, saying it does plan to challenge the lawsuit. We also heard from the FTC chair, Lena Khan. We're going to hear from Amanda Lewis in just a second, a former FTC attorney. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. A 1.5% drop on the S&P 500 today, a 1.6% drop on the NASDAQ, a more than 1% drop on the Dow. The Dow breaking below that 200-day moving average. This is a revaluation of valuations, and a big part of the reason for the agita is what we're seeing right behind me, a Bloomberg dollar spot index at its highest levels of the year here, a renewed strength in that dollar, of course, tracking the renewed strength that we've been seeing in Treasury yields. That's a big part of the equation as to why investors are maybe starting to throw in the towel, because the relief that they were looking for earlier this year from a potential drop in rates, and more importantly, some sort of plateau in the dollar, at least for right now here uh, at the end of September, they're not getting that. As for some of the individual movers, there were a lot to choose from here. More than 90% of the S&P 500 finished lower on the day, and that includes Tesla down a percent, Amazon down about four, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And then, of course, outside the S&P, you had a lot of other names also getting batted around here, including Sirius XM Radio down 3% on the back of the news about that Liberty Media deal. But if you're looking for a bright spot today, it was primarily in the biotech space. A lot of small biotechs just co Incidentally, seem to have a lot of few papers as well as FDA recommendations come out today. That includes Intercept Pharmaceuticals, which rallied a whopping 79%. Of course, we do want to go back to the macro here and talk a little bit about the moves that we've been seeing in the Treasury curve, the inversion that we've been talking about for so long, the longest inversion in the modern cycle that, we, that we're having right now. The real concern isn't so much the inversion itself, but when you start to get that re-steepening of the curve, typically, historically, that sort of comes in tandem with the recession here. Another part of the fears and the jitters that we got today with a key part of the curve, the five-year, 30-year part of that uh, yield curve now, uninverting that occurred yesterday and is steepened even further today, Katie. Let's go from the bond market to one of the biggest stories of the day. Of course, we're talking about the Federal Trade Commission suing Amazon. It's accusing the e-commerce giant of monopolizing online marketplace services by degrading quality for shoppers and overcharging sellers. We heard from FTC Chair Lena Khan earlier today at a Bloomberg event. These are a set of tactics, but ultimately Amazon has pursued them to deprive actual and potential competitors of the ab ability to gain the scale and momentum needed to effectively compete online. And having achieved and protected its monopoly power, our complaint details how Amazon is now exploiting that monopoly power in ways that harm customers. Joining us now is Amanda Lewis. She is former FTC attorney and currently at the law firm Cunia, Gilbert, and LaDuca. And Amanda, given your background at the FTC, reading through the complaint, of course, filed by the FTC and 17 states, when you look at those arguments, how might this case go for the FTC? Great. Um, yeah, so big news today. This has been a long time coming. Um, we we in the antitrust world have been waiting and, and watching for this. The the FTC is actually on, on strong grounds here. They have made a case that is very actually focused on traditional antitrust law. Um, now we're applying antitrust law to digital markets. And that does present some unique challenges and, and courts, I think, have struggled with that, frankly. So that that will be uh, that will be a challenge. But as Chair Khan said, this case is fo focused on anti-competitive conduct that causes harm to consumers. And, and that harm is in price effects. And you, you well, don't get more traditional than that under well, antitrust. Well, well, give us a, a sense here, uh, Amanda, because I'm a little confused. When we talk about price effects, and we know that Amazon, at least publicly, has, based on some other cases they've been involved with, has tried to make the case that, look, you're paying less for whatever you know, gadget or, or, or whatever you know, thing you're buying off of Amazon than you would if Amazon didn't exist. What is the price effect specifically that that the FTC is focusing on that is somehow detrimental to me, the consumer. Right. So what's going on here is that Amazon has a rule 
that says uh, third party sellers cannot offer their products for a lower price on a, on another platform or another retail channel. And so that means, I, let's say I'm a third party seller, I wanna offer my product for a lower price on Walmart or Target or, um, or Walmart or Target wants to offer a discount on my product. I have to tell them no. I have to say, please don't offer a discount, don't offer a lower price to consumers because if you do that, I will get kicked off of Amazon. I will not get the buy box on Amazon. I will get punished by Amazon. And so you can see how that plays out. Somebody, a, a seller, a company who is dependent on Amazon for 90% plus of their sales, mm -hmm. which many are, um, actually have to tell other retailers, don't, don't discount my product. Yeah. I'm curious, though, as to what the solution is. I, I think anybody with half a brain could kind of see some of the problems that we have and not just with Amazon. We don't want to just pick on them. There are a lot of other big tech companies that quite frankly are kind of in the same boat. But what's the solution? Because just saying break them up doesn't necessarily solve the problem, particularly when there's an ecosystem when it comes, particularly when it comes to e-commerce that kind of only works if it's all together, I would think. So I think the key is, 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 doing away with these policies, either having a, a court declare that they're illegal or you have Congress step up, which, you know, I heard you talk earlier about Congress not stepping up to do their job. And this is another area where uh, congressional action would would really help um, and, and is overdue. So so I think the solution yep. is we need more competition. Yeah. And how do you unlock that competition? You you make it illegal for this, this anti-competitive conduct, which, which is actually already illegal under current law. Um, but but do, so, do, the, so step, do the steps need to be more proactive rather than waiting for these behemoths to become behemoths? You mentioned Congress. I mean, you worked in Congress as a staffer for the House Judiciary Committee. You worked on a 16-month investigation into some of these big tech companies. Were those the ideas that came out of that investigation, the idea that if you can sort of stop that and, and nip that in the bud, that solves the problem? Yeah, so there were a combination of uh, solutions and recommendations that came out of that investigation. And some of them are to say, hey, let's let's stop this early, like you're saying, in terms of being more proactive in merger review and challenging mergers earlier on in Amazon's career, uh, existence, let's say, when they acquired diapers.com, which was a, a fierce competitor. Most people today probably have never even heard of the company, but they were positioned to, to be a challenger. Um, so, so yeah, so one piece of it is blocking mergers earlier that present a, a, a risk mm -hmm. of, uh, of a company becoming a monopoly. And then the, the other key is just setting bright line rules. So Congress is in a position where they can set the rules of the road for these U.S. companies and it's our responsibility. We should be setting the rules of the road, not leaving it to Europe while we sit on the sidelines. So you can also have just very clear prohibitions on uh, MFNs, which is what this pricing policy is a form of, or exclusive dealing, um, certain forms of self-preferencing, or like we talked about tying. Um, so so yeah. you can also just prohibit that conduct. So there, there, there are solutions, uh, but yeah. it would mean that Congress would have to act. Yeah, and that, that could be a big heavy lift. Of course, we're all eyes right now to see uh, the progress uh, that uh, Khan makes on this lawsuit and whatever pushback she's certainly going to get, not just from Amazon, but from the political environment that you know so well. Am Amanda, going to have to leave it there, but we're going to talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Amanda Lewis over at Cuneo, Filber, and uh, LaDuca, and a former FTC attorney, a closer look there at the lawsuit filed today by the U.S. FTC against Amazon. We want to pivot from that to breaking news. Earnings out of Costco crossing the wire right now. 4Q U.S. comp sales, if you exclude gas, up about 3.1 percent, relatively in line with estimates. John Edwards joining us right now, who helps to lead our consumer coverage here at Bloomberg. And uh, let's talk about this. I mean, we always get these sort of monthly updates, so we kind of have a sense of kind of the direction that Costco is going in here. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what do you make of these numbers? I mean, they're relatively in line, $78 billion, $79 billion in revenue and EPS coming in at 480 Six, which was also a B. Yeah, uh, no, it's another solid quarter for Costco, uh, much as expected. 
Uh, as I look at the comp sales figures, they do look a little uh, soft, but um, you know, basically, as you say, in line. So they're uh, you know continuing to hold up, uh, you know, oper um, you know, occupying their spot in the market where mm. they're you know they obviously a discounter, but also, you know, appeal somewhat to the higher end of the market, given that they Costco do, appeals to the higher end of the market? Well, given that they charge uh, membership fees oh, that I not gotcha. everybody can afford. Is that pay. a luxury buy now? Yeah. Am I, I've never, I've only been in Costco <laughs> like three times. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah. What is the Costco profile? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people love going to Costco, really across income brackets. Yeah. But to your point, they do appeal to uh, that sort of discount crowd as well. Mm -hmm. Where do you situate that among its peers? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely not down with like the dollar stores or the deep, deep discounters. Again, because of that membership fee, you know, if people don't feel like they have, you know, that 50 or $60 to, to spend every year, uh, they're going to go elsewhere. But uh, those who do have that available are able to get the uh, the deeper discounts there at Costco. Uh, people have been waiting for them to, uh, you know, come out with a, a fee increase, which they've been par uh, promising to do for some time. Uh, it doesn't look like that's happened again this quarter. So that, uh, yeah. you know, the market's going to continue to watch for that. Did you see that story earlier today about Target and how they're oh, shutting yeah. down stores because they're seeing theft, including yeah. the store here? Yeah. That's legit? Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, uh, it looks like it, at least for those nine locations they're talking about. And, yeah. and it's, it's been, as, as you say, you know, uh, uh, something that we've really been trying to get our heads around. Yeah. How much of this is really, you know, new, this sort of yeah. retail theft uh, trend? Yeah. And, I wish we had more time. we got to talk about this because <laughs> I've seen some data this suggest that some of this is not quite as uh, what yeah the exactly are I mean there's there's serious stuff yeah. going on it's not that clear right. that it's much worse than right but a lot of the theft isn't coming from the actual stores it's coming from there is the supply that, chain sure. either yeah. and they're just using this as a cop out anyway yeah. uh, John Edwards uh, will, uh, who helps uh, lead our consumer coverage uh, here at Bloomberg uh, coming up here we're going to focus in on the labor strikes Joe Biden the president of the United States down with the United Auto Workers in Michigan earlier today we're going to talk about what he had to say and more importantly what the man who's going to be following him to Tomorrow, we'll have to say as well. This is Bloomberg. You guys, the UAW, you saved the automobile industry back in 2008 and before. Made a lot of sacrifices. Gave up a lot, and the companies were in trouble. But now they're doing incredibly well. And guess what? You should be doing incredibly well, too. The president of the United States there speaking to United Auto Worker Union members picketing uh, outside a plant in Michigan. Kelly Line down in Washington, D.C. right now with an update here on what we learned here. I guess this provides a bit of a morale boost. What else did we learn about the president's visit today? Well, we know he is firmly on the side of unions, Romaine, and that he was asked while on the picket line if they, the workers at the UAW deserved a 40 percent wage increase, and he said yes. He also said that they made a lot of sacrifices uh, and, as a result, uh, deserved to be compensated. And in many ways, Romaine, this was a really historic moment. Never before in history have we seen a sitting U.S. president join striking workers at the picket line. But that is exactly what Biden did today, of course, at the invitation of the UAW president, Sean Fain, who was there on the tarmac to greet him when Air Force One landed in Michigan and was standing alongside him at the picket line. Remember, this is an invitation that has not actually been extended by union leadership to former President Donald Trump, who will be making his own trip to Detroit tomorrow counter-programming the Republican primary debate, but addressing uh, UAW workers. As we are reminded, Romain, we are in the middle of the 2024 election cycle, and we are talking here about the two men who are seen as the likely nominees of their respective parties. And a UAW endorsement is still hanging in the balance here. The union has not actually come out to endorse any candidate, the sitting president, uh, Joe Biden in particular, but maybe Biden scoring some favor points with the union today by showing up at the picket line. All right. Well, he's certainly uh, now become a political issue if it wasn't already, and we'll of course, be on pins and needles to see what the former president has to say tomorrow uh, when he goes down there as well. Kidley Lines out in Washington. Stick with us. A lot more coverage coming up here on The Close, including a look at signature brands. Betty Crocker, that's one of their biggest brands. You know Betty Crocker, don't you? I know her well, yeah. <laughs> you know her well. <laughs> yeah. She's tasty. We're going to get some insights out of the CEO after the break. This is Bloomberg.
confluence of, of events here in the U.S. that really rattled markets across the board from start to finish with the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the NASDAQ composite all moving lower by more than 1% on the day. Now back to some of the levels that we saw back in early June, both the Dow and the Russell below their 200-day moving averages, and now downtrends forming on some of those technical charts. A big part of the reason is for the uptrend that we continue to see in the dollar and the uptrend that we continue to see in U.S. Treasury yields. Throw in the potential for a government shutdown this week, as well as broader concerns about economic conditions, and you get a sense here as to why this market is on edge. The VIX, which had been largely dormant for a good portion of the year, perking back up today to around 19. And if you're looking for that flight into Haven assets, Katie, you were talking about this a little bit earlier. There are no Haven assets right now. The Haven right now is the sideline. A little bit of buying in the dollar, and certainly some buying in some of the shortest of short-term treasuries. But for the most part, most investors are choosing to sit this one out. Well, you go from the mood in the stock market to U.S. consumer confidence slumped to a four-month low in September. That's according to the conference board. American workers are increasingly concerned about their finances and employment prospects, even though many economists are forecasting that the U.S. can avert a recession. For more insight on the health of the consumer, let's bring in Jared Constanti. He is the CEO of Signature Brands. Signature Brands, of course, has Betty Crocker, Cake Mate, Pumpkin Masters mm. in its lineup. And I want to talk a lot about baking, but let's start on the state of the U.S. consumer. Obviously, high inflation has been a story for years now. How has that filtered through your portfolio of brands? Well, it's certainly been a challenging period with inflation uh, where it has been. But what we're seeing is a really compelling turn. Uh, we consistently are keeping our finger on the pulse of the consumer and how they're feeling and how they're uh, going to act and what they're reporting. And we're finding that as inflation eases, uh, they're expecting to have a fun holiday season, which is encouraging for anyone in that business. I see a pumpkin behind you, and then I take a look at your notes. Uh, you say that you're expecting the largest Halloween ever. Talk to us a little bit about that. What does that mean in the context of Betty Crocker, for example? Sure. So as people celebrate holidays, they get together with family. They get these rituals that are done year after year after year that are passed down uh, from parent to child. And whether it's carving a pumpkin or decorating a cookie or a cupcake or a cake, these activities that are all about that special family moment and passing down those crafts and uh, rituals every year are what consumers are reporting heading into this season, being ready to do more than they've ever done before in the case of Halloween. Uh, when you sort of look at uh, your core consumer, particularly for your brands here, uh, do, you, uh, do you worry at all that there is the potential for trade down? The idea here that if economic conditions are softening, if consumer confidence is waning here, that people will look to save money. And I know Betty Crocker products aren't exactly expensive, but I'm sure you have to know people do tend to look for alternatives. Of course. What we're seeing is a bifurcation. So products that people have a lot of joy with, and that are sort of front of foot purchases, uh, they will stick with brands, they will stick with fun, value added, uh, positive memory kind of products. Uh, and the products that are less uh, important to them emotionally is where we see consumers trading down. A holiday celebration, a ritual that's done once a year is not something that generally people are willing to trade down for. Uh, products that are, you know, feeding the family or more basic in nature in terms of their routine. Mm -hmm. That's where we see people saving their money, trading down in brand, trading down perhaps in quality, but not in these annual rituals that are really emotionally charged for folks. Yeah, we're showing pictures right now of the Betty Crocker uh, cake mix. Um, Delicious. Yeah, we're not showing the the frosting. I used to, when I was a kid, I used to eat the frosting yeah. right off the jar. You didn't even need the cake. Uh, I, I am I am curious uh, uh, here, uh, Jared, when we talk about um, heading into the holiday season, and more importantly, I guess, how people consume things, as you know, uh, or how we buy things, I should say. You know, things have changed a lot. Is your general strategy at Signature uh, to sort of just continue through the retail route, the third-party uh, retailers, or is there more of a direct-to-consumer strategy in there? Hey. 93% of consumers are telling us um, that they are going into store to purchase their holiday needs. Uh, that doesn't mean that things aren't purchased online. It doesn't mean that uh, people aren't shopping through the digital channel. But as it, as it relates to these purchases that are really important, that are for family activity and uh, family joy and larger gatherings, which people are reporting that they're going to be doing more and more, they want to feel it, look at it, 
and evaluate it and really make a choice, often with their children with them. So again, when it's more emotional, when it's more of a family purchase for a family activity, it's a lot more front of foot and people are wanting to be in, in person to do that. Well, Jared, the retailers that you sell through, what sense do you have of their inventory levels and how well prepared they are to potentially meet that demand? So because the last few years have been tough, uh, retailers are putting themselves in a position where they're being pretty conservative this year. And what, what we're trying to work with our retailer partners to encourage them to do is to prepare for what we believe is to come based on the consumer data that we've got access to. Uh, otherwise, they'll fall short. And it's tricky because the last few years have been tough as it relates to inflation and the pressure on family budgets. But with this data that we're seeing, we're trying to get the word out that we're expecting a really strong holiday as a result of where people are choosing to spend their money. Yeah. They can't make these huge purchases, but they are leaving opportunity for little moments of joy yeah. that are really fun. Uh, not the big vacation, but the weekend getaway, you know, not the huge uh, purchase, but a small purchase or a family gathering or a family activity that doesn't cost a huge amount, but it is a fun, special moment. I am curious as for your company and how you're holding up when it comes to uh, supplies. I mean, we know there's been a lot of discussion about supply chain issues and not really being able to produce enough of the products that consumers actually want to buy here. Are you comfortable right now with your inventory levels, whether it's with the raw goods or the finished product? We are. Uh, our supply chain team has been all over planning, execution, uh, preparing, building inventory in advance. We've got a strong labor pool. We've got great productivity, uh, and we are prepared. And this is why we're trying to partner with our retail friends to get them uh, fully stocked up, because if they're out of stock and it's too late, there's not a lot we can do. So we're trying to prepare for it so we have a strong season. All right, Jared, great to catch up with you. Jared Costanzi there, the CEO of Signature Brands, and, of course, Katie, one of its most signature brands, of course, is Betty Crocker. Mm -hmm. You're a baker, aren't you? Uh, very, very casually. Very, I like what does to that make, mean, casually? I, I like to make cakes in the microwave. You can do that as okay. long as you have a mug and some water. A so. mug and water. Yeah. Okay. Does that taste the same as a cake in a oven? You know, it honestly does. Okay. I've never tried that. You should. Uh, maybe. I don't know. You, if you make one for me, we have a microwave downstairs <laughs> in the building. That's true. All right. Coming up here on the big program, we're going to talk about U.S. home sales softening last month, but <laughs> prices... They're at a record high. Make sense of this for me. Daryl Fair Fairweather, Redfin Chief Economist, going to be joining us with her outlook on the housing market. That conversation coming up in a bit. This is Bloomberg. All right, the U.S. housing market has really been a conundrum wrapped inside of a riddle, wrapped inside of an enigma. New home sales in August fell to a five-month low. Meanwhile, home prices climbed to a record high, leaving potential buyers fighting over a limited supply of homes for sale. Bloomberg News U.S. real estate reporter Prashant Gopal joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And we've been talking about the supply-demand dynamics for a while here, and they just don't seem to be getting any better. Yeah, it's a very weird situation where mortgage rates go up, making housing more expensive, but that just pushes prices up higher. Is there anything to sort of arrest that, Prashant? I mean, I, I mean, I know we just can't create new housing supply overnight, but something's got to give. Yeah, it's it, you know, the really the only way out of this might actually be to give builders time to create more supply, because you know if the issue here is that rates have risen so quickly that it's sort of locking in uh, American home buyers, they don't, homeowners. They don't want to sell and give up that great sub 3% rate that they have. So they're staying put. And if rates somehow did fall, that might only result in higher prices, which would make housing expensive again. So it's, uh, you know, it's almost, it, whatever you do almost, other than build more homes, uh, it, it makes things less affordable. Yeah, Prashant, it's a great point that you have to imagine once rates actually drop, there will be a lot of pent-up demand for housing. But reading through uh, some of the coverage of today's data, it's actually pretty, pretty amazing to reflect that if you look from June 2022 to January 2023, home prices actually declined. But I would assume at this point we've well erased that. Yeah, I mean, that 
that little bit of a dip is uh, is gone, and and we're back on we're, prices are rising once again nationally. And of course, it depends on where you are around the country, but in 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 much of the country, you are seeing price increases again. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. Is there anywhere in the United States uh, that there is some relief, or is this really a nationwide conversation? Right. So some of these markets that got overinflated during the COVID uh, housing boom um, are, are have, you know, prices are still declining there. So places like Phoenix, uh, Las Vegas, Austin, Texas, uh, are seeing declines, although those those declines aren't you know huge right now. They they've kind of moderated a bit, because yeah. you know this lock-in effect that I described earlier, it's happening everywhere, including the the, the some of these weaker markets. All right, uh, Prashant Goble uh, giving us uh, here an update on some of the data that we've just gotten on the housing market. Let's get some further insights out of Daryl Fairweather, chief economist over at Redfin. And Daryl, I, I want to start off here with just the idea of kind of. What sort of incentive a buyer, a potential buyer, would even have in this market, assuming that you're not paying with cash? I mean, who wants a 7-plus percent mortgage right now, particularly if you believe that rates aren't actually going to stay at this level? The thing that buyers recognize is that housing is not going to get more affordable. It's not going to get more affordable to buy a home because, as Prashant mentioned, if mortgage rates were to come down, there would be a lot of demand coming into the market. There would be more competition, buyers fighting with each other for the limited number of homes, and that would drive up prices. So unless you get really lucky with timing, which is difficult to do, especially with such limited inventory, it's better to buy earlier than later because if you wait, it's probably going to be harder to get into the housing market to buy that first home. Yeah, and one con one sort of uh, fallout from this that we've seen is actually sort of the migration that we started to see uh, away from more high-cost housing markets to somewhat moderately lower uh, housing markets here. And I know not everybody has the luxury of just being able uh, to pack up and move here, but do you think that that's a trend that could actually maybe end up being something much bigger? That is what's happening. We're seeing a record share of home buyers looking to relocate out of their metro area. They're going from San Francisco to Sacramento or from DC to Myrtle Beach. And these places offer a lower cost of living, lower housing costs. People can achieve that dream that they want of owning a home and being able to afford everything that they need. And it does take a big move, but more and more people are making that leap of faith. When you think about prospective home buyers, first time home buyers, uh, how is this breaking down on a generational basis when you think about millennials or even Gen Zers who would like to buy a home but can't right now? It's interesting because there were some millennials who were able to take advantage of record low mortgage rates during the pandemic. They got those 3% rates. They are pretty much set. The millennials who didn't get in in the last couple of years, they feel really discouraged. They feel like they missed the boat and now they'll never be able to own a home, at least a portion of them do. Gen Z is a bit more optimistic. They are in an economy that's doing pretty well for them with the unemployment rate being so low. There's economic opportunity all over the country. So if a Gen Zer is willing to live somewhere where housing is more affordable and they have a good paying job, they're actually better poised to get into the housing market than millennials were at their age. Well, speaking as a discouraged millennial who maybe is looking at uh, some of these rates and calculating monthly payments, do you have any sense of what the pent-up demand on the other side of extremely high mortgage rates might look like? Some of those uh, prospective home buyers who are waiting for rates to drop and potentially trying to time this market. Buyers are extremely rate sensitive. Anytime rates drop, they enter the market. When they go up, they exit the market. There are plenty of people who are just looking at how much they can afford. And whenever there's a home that fits that, fits that criteria, they're going to jump on it. So yeah, if rates fall, I expect there to be even more home buyers out there. And because supply is so limited, that would result in more competition, higher prices. Uh, this gets us to sort of the, the broader, longer term uh, issues as well, Daryl, about housing supply. And we know that there are a lot of jurisdictions that are trying to come up with creative ways to sort of address this, uh, whether it's building more multifamily units or just simply allowing greater development across uh, parts of their uh, cities and municipalities that they wouldn't in the past here. Uh, is there a sort of a threshold that you look at where we you think we could sort of reach an inflection point in terms of supply? You know, there are some
some markets that are doing a really great job of building more housing, particularly in the South. Uh, California has passed some laws that would make it easier to build housing, but we haven't really seen that turn into a meaningful number of housing units yet that would improve affordability. I think we're headed in the right direction in terms of the new construction that's coming online, but I don't think it's enough to really solve the problem. You know, a decade from now, we may be in a different situation given demographic trends, but I think that's too far out to really see what the housing market would be like yeah. for the next five to 10 years. I think it's going to be pretty much the same in terms of worsening affordability. For those folks watching this who are still renting here, uh, give us a sort of a sense here as to exactly what they're facing. Are they also, because it seems like there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence about rising rents and uh, the idea here, but are, are rents still at, at somewhat favorable level where somebody who maybe uh, wants to buy a house can still be comfortable renting without too much of an economic difference? Right now, it is more affordable to rent than it is to buy a home in most parts of the country. There are a few exceptions like in Detroit and Houston. For the most part, renters are going to be saving money compared to those who are buying a home. That's probably not going to be true forever, but I can see that being true into next year if mortgage rates do remain elevated. But when you rent, you don't have any protection that your rent will stay low. So if you wait too long to enter the housing market, you may be regretting it because your rent may be going up a couple of years from now. And how is that translating into rents around the country? Because looking through your notes, you make the interesting point that if you look at the West, you look at the South, you actually are seeing rents drop a little bit, at least on a monthly basis. Yes, I mean, the places in the South where there's a lot of new construction, rents, uh, the, the affordability like there, right there is poised to improve. On the West Coast, it's a bit of a different story. The reason that rents are, are not going up anymore is because people are leaving. They're leaving for places where housing is more affordable. So I think we're just going to have to see how that plays out over the next year. The rental market is so tightly is so tightly wound to the housing market that if the housing market looks not so great, there are going to be more people who want to rent, and then that would drive up rent. So it, there's a lot of pushing and pulling forces happening in the rental market, but for the most part, I think rents will will stay, you know, at these levels into next year. And Daryl, of course, one of the big uh, sort of narratives over the past three years or, uh, or so over the pandemic was this work from anywhere trend, uh, where basically you didn't have to be tied to some of these big metro areas. Are we still seeing that migration, that shift around the country? Remote work is more prevalent now than it was before the pandemic by a long shot. You know, it's down from its pandemic peak, but it is still a part of our economy and a part of our housing market. And it's why these really expensive areas can't hold on to their residents anymore because they can go somewhere else and still find economic opportunities, remote work jobs, or even in-person jobs in these other parts of the country that have had a lot of people move in recently. So remote work is definitely impacting the economy and it's why the economy is just different now than it was before the pandemic. Yeah, well said. Uh, Daryl, always great to talk to you. Daryl Fair Fairweather, Chief Economist over at Redfin, a look at the housing market. And uh, don't forget, Katie, we're going to get some more uh, housing numbers uh, a little bit uh, later uh, in the week, of course, uh, when the, some of the uh, pending home sales numbers come out as well here. And my guess is we're going to see more of the same there. A lot more uh, coverage coming up here on the big program. We're going to set you up for what to watch on Wednesday. This is Bloomberg. All right, a big day for global markets here on this Tuesday. Let's push ahead to Wednesday. Katie, where do you want to start? I think we should start actually on Tuesday night. Today, 9.30 p.m., we get some numbers out of China, industrial mm. profits. Okay. Uh, of course, the Chinese economy has been a hot topic, so uh, yeah. it's important to see how their industri industrial profits are faring. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, too. Back here in the U.S., we're going to get orders for durable goods here, a key measure here of our industrial economy. Yeah, and I feel like the conversation around the U.S. economy has been a little bit tortured. It felt like we were talking about a soft landing being a done deal. Now it's not so sure. Yeah, absolutely. Here, and remember the metaverse? <laughs> well, apparently it's still a thing. We're actually really? told that, yeah, that apparently Mark Zuckerberg tomorrow, the CEO okay. of Meta, co-founder of Meta, or actually Facebook, but now Meta, right. as they transition, a big two-day virtual launch of its next generation little headset. The very expensive ones. I don't know how much they cost. I'm not buying one, no matter how much it costs. But well. All right, but it'll be interesting. I mean, again, you see the strategy that they're trying to chart uh, with this here. We're also going to get some earnings tomorrow. We get Micron. Of course, Micron, it's up about 35 percent 
year to date. Not quite NVIDIA levels, 36% or so. Uh, Going to be really interesting to read through these numbers. And again, AI, we talk about it all oh, the time. Gosh. How many times are they going to say AI? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. We'll see. We'll find out very soon. There's a GOP debate here, of course, uh, as uh, the Republican Party tries to determine who its nominee is going to be for the presidential race next year. The guy who probably is going to be the nominee isn't going to be there. No. The debate taking place in California, but President, former President Trump, he's not going to be there. He's going to be in Michigan, right? Yeah. Counter-programming, as Kelly Lines called it. Counter-programming. Of course, we'll have full coverage of the debate as well as the pre a former president's appearance out at the UAW line tomorrow. And, of course, full coverage of the markets. Appreciate you joining us here on this Tuesday afternoon. Stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next. This is Bloomberg.